Shaka Zulu, spurned by his father for being an illegitimate child, Shaka, along with his mother Nandi, traveled from tribe to tribe in his youth, seeking stability. And it didn't come easy or quickly. They'd be taken in by one tribe, only to be kicked back out to fend for themselves again, then taken in again, then kicked out again. Even when they were taken in, life was not easy. Many of the other kids tormented young Shaka, called him names, beat him, made him sleep under rotting animal skins and more. And all of this early tragedy, it hardened him. It sharpened him. He grew into a powerful and bloodthirsty warrior with a brilliant military mind who would end up never being bullied again or beaten. Well, not until the very end. Not until shortly after he completely lost his mind and went mad. From his trials and tribulations, a leader was born. Or a monster. Or both. We head to South Africa and to the Zulu nation today. Shaka was the son of Senzan Kagona, a Zulu king, but not his legitimate son. And being born out of wedlock would lead to his childhood hardships. His father forced Shaka and his mother out and back to her clan, who then forced them out again. And then Shaka's father would try to have Shaka killed several times over the course of his life to keep him from interfering with the succession of his other legitimate sons. Nandi and young Shaka finally found shelter with the sub-clan of the powerful Tetwa people. And when Shaka was a young man, Din Gizwayo, a Tetwa chieftain, sent Shaka into battle and a star was born. And for the next six years, he served with brilliance as a warrior of the Tetwa Empire. And then he was given the chance to build his own empire, an empire of the Zulu people, his father's people. Through several assassinations, Shaka would become chief and he would build what started out as a tribe of less than 2,000 people into an empire of over 250,000 Zulu. A gifted tactician, he developed standard tactics which the Zulu would use in battle after battle after battle. Battles they would win time and time again. And in doing so, Shaka's life became the subject of numerous, colorful, sometimes real, sometimes exaggerated, sometimes probably completely fabricated stories of his triumphs. And I look forward to sharing these stories with you today, and also to sharing with you some of the history of South Africa, the land where the Zulu nation would rise, a fascinating and complicated and beautiful nation. I learned so much, hope you will too, in the Shaka Zulu, aka intestinal beetle heaven, that'll make sense soon, historical, fantastical, stomping, slashing, giant fighting edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. What the shit has been going on in America, Nimrod? Lucifina, have you been stirring the pot? Praise Bo Jangles, let's speed things along to the spring and Yacht Rock season triple M. I'm Dan Cummins, the Suck Master, Pootie and Juju Inker, Nick Cage's acting coach, and you are listening to Time Suck. And hopefully the world is not on fire right now. I uh, recorded this episode on January 7th, the day after the D.C. riots. I have a lot of thoughts about what's been happening. I'm sure you do, too. I'm not going to share mine today. Emotions too heightened, in my opinion, for, for many to, uh, to want to hear them. And it'll probably stay that way for a while. And recent events, you know, they're getting plenty of coverage damn near everywhere else right now. No shortage of commentary out there. Uh, someday, I think we are going to have to suck the election fraud conspiracy and uh, do a biopic on President Trump as well. I don't know how many people will <laughs> make happy, how many people make angry, but uh, someday, someday you might have to do it. Uh, right now, these stories still unfolding, and they have nothing to do with today's topic. Right now, I think the best thing I can do is to continue to try and, uh, continue to try and provide some historical escapism. Maybe we can learn some lessons from the past we might be able to apply to today's dilemmas. Uh, hail Nimrod and stay safe out there, everybody. Uh, Time Suck Thrasher parody champion crewneck sweatshirt in the store today at badmagicmerch.com. Very fitting. Uh, things feeling like they're on fire. Uh, this badass sweatshirt makes Lucifina wet. It's made out of 137 pure winged bush cobra skin. 100% renewable imported resource from the heart of Liberia. And Space Lizard Matt Johnson sent in that material selection suggestion. Thank you, Matt. A uh, quick charity reminder, this month we donated 20% of the Patreon subscriptions for Bad Magic Productions to the Riggins Idaho EMTs. Able to cut them a check for $11,600. Going to go a long ways to keeping their equipment up to date, keep them transporting those living in the Salmon River Canyon around Riggins to the hospital on that long ride people sometimes need. Thanks again for uh, that. And if you'd like to donate yourself, you can go to facebook.com slash Riggins Ambulance. We'll put that link in the episode description. And, uh, and now let's head back to Africa.
We were just in Liberia for General Butt Naked a few weeks ago in SUC 222. Ah, man, that one has stuck with me. Dear God, I'm not talking about my fake flying snakes that are in fact real and very not fake. I'm talking about the carnage we went over. Now when I complain about something or feel like complaining, I think of the millions of people who had their world turned into a dystopian, blood-filled nightmare in Liberia and Sierra Leone in the 90s. My God, that shit was brutal. Heads getting literally kicked down the street like fucking soccer balls. General butt naked, standing on a car in the middle of an urban war zone with a machete in one hand and a severed dick in the other. Yeek! Thank God uh, nothing as crazy as that going on right now in America. Nothing, nowhere, nowhere near that crazy. Today, instead of going to the Liberia, we're going to head much further south, down to South Africa, a country on the southernmost tip of the African continent where the Zulu nation was born. We're going to spend most of our time in the early 19th century, but we'll go further back to, uh, to explore the nation's origins a bit. Today, South Africa might best be known for its natural beauty, and it is so beautiful. I was lucky enough to spend a month there uh, once, and that trip has really stayed with me. Hope to get back someday. Maybe if I uh, do get back, I can learn how to say a lot of the words I'm going to have to try and say today a lot more intelligently. I <laughs> just want to uh, say a little preface. Uh, figuring out how to pronounce a ton of very difficult words today, holy shit, not easy. Almost everyone pronouncing them on local news videos or travel vlogs I could find or South African or Indian. The South African accent, not my accent. Wish it was. Way cooler, a lot prettier. Trying to imitate how I hear South Africans say these words has proved challenging. And the Indian accent, not even in the ballpark of my accent. Do my best. And I think 99% of the time, I think I'm going to at least be, uh, you know, in the ballpark if I don't get it 100% right. So here we go. South Africa overflows with amazing sights from the misty mountains of the Mahu Gaskluf to the Sabi waterfalls of the uh, Pumalanga to Sadwana's Bay's Seven Mile Reef. This natural beauty along with South Africa's bustling cities like Cape Town, such a cool city, draws a lot of tourism. South Africa, actually the second most visited country in all of Africa, right behind Morocco. With a population of, you know, closing on 60 million, it's the fifth largest nation on the massive continent, the second largest continent next to Asia. 80% of the country's population, ethnically black African, roughly 9% considered mixed race of some kind. Almost 8% of South Africa's population is white and about 2% are ethnic Indian. South Africa, unfortunately, a nation of massive wealth disparity. Much of that disparity reveals itself along racial lines. The descendants of Shaka Zulu not faring nearly as well as the descendants of early Dutch and British colonists. The effects of apartheid, the country's system of racial segregation in place until 1991, not 1891, 1991, uh, still deeply felt. The country's richest households, almost 10 times wealthier than poor households, according to World Bank estimates. The richest 10% of South Africans own 71% of the wealth. The poorest 60% own 7%. The nation's still divided into primarily affluent white African neighborhoods and poor black African slums. Overall, black Africans earn only roughly 15% of their white counterparts person to person. Uh, apartheid, in its, apartheid in its effects, that deserves a separate suck. Sucking Nelson Mandela would provide a good excuse to do that. We should do that someday, but not sucking Nelson Mandela or apartheid today. Sucking Shaka Zulu. Uh, today, we're going back to the early 19th century when a warrior would reshape the region forever. And we'll spend a fair amount of time in the end of the 18th century, learn about Shaka's father and mother a bit as well. Uh, Senzan Gakona, Kushenzan Gakona, or King Shaka. Thank God it generally goes by King Shaka. Way easier to say, holy shit. Uh, considered by historians to be one of the greatest military strategists of the 19th century. During his brief reign, more than 100 chiefdoms were brought together under one ruler. A new Zulu kingdom was born that survived not only the death of its founder, but later military defeat and calculated attempts by outside forces to break it up. The kingdom grew from just a few hundred people to a peak population of 9 million by the late 20th century, and it wouldn't have gotten started without King Zulu, King Shaka. Uh, today, there are over 14 million Zulu people in Africa. King Shaka Zulu, a contemporary of Napoleon, subject of Suck 134, has been given the nickname the African Napoleon by some for being a gifted military strategist. One historian I listened to uh, on YouTube talk, talked about how due to the ripple effects regarding how he changed warfare and kingdom building in Southern Africa, he ended up changing the borders of African kingdoms, not just around South Africa, but throughout the continent, similar to how Napoleon redrew the map of Europe. And part of that is due to the ripple effect that his, uh, his, his wars had and the way he changed battlefield tactics and then people he defeated, those who survived, uh, they would adopt his tactics and go on to defeat others and so on and so forth. And it kept spreading around the continent. 
Shaka reigned as king of his expanding empire from 1816 until his assassination in 1828. He accomplished much in just those dozen years. Uh, yeah, military tactician unlike any African in South Africa who had ever lived before him, at least as far as we know he was. Uh, the Zulu nation he created and ruled did not have a written, written record of his accomplishments in life, uh, not as he lived. The Zulu lived at that time in an oral tradition. Their legends before, during, after Shaka's time were spoken, told, and retold from generation to generation without ever being put to paper. If any greater military minds existed before his, their stories have been uh, lost or mostly lost to history. Shaka, while heralded by many as a great leader, also been denounced by many for being a ruthless tyrant. He may have been the most vicious African ruler South Africa had ever seen. Uh, being a military strategist in the 19th century did not come without bloodshed. And for King Zulu, it came with a lot of bloodshed. A lot more than can be justified, as you will soon see. Some estimate that during his reign, Shaka caused the death of more than a million people. Shaka's war has contributed to a series of forced migrations known in various parts of Southern Africa as the Nimrod guide my mushmouth across the next few very challenging sentences. Uh, Mufakani, uh, Difakani, Lifakani, or Fetkani. Uh, groups of refugees from Shaka's assaults, just known as that in different you know, tribal languages. Uh, groups of refugees from Shaka's assaults, first Hlubi and Nguani clans, later, later followed by the uh, Mantatees, the Mantabili of Misikila, <laughs> oh my God, Misil Akazi, crossed the Drakensberg Mountains to the west, smashing smaller tribes in their path. Famine followed, extermination of populations followed, crops destroyed, herds slaughtered. It was chaos and Shaka was the center of it all. By his hand, old chiefdoms vanished. New ones were created. The new chiefdoms were very different than the ones before them. They were stronger and they were a lot more violent. And there would be no going back to the less violent old ways before them. So began the legend of Shaka Zulu, a legend that would be passed down from Zulu to Zulu to maybe a guy named Bob or Timmy here and there, but mostly guys with Zulu names in an oral tradition. It's partially historical truth, partially mythology. Uh, much of what we'll hear in today's episode, including quotes from Shaka and, uh, you know, others come from, of course, this oral tradition. Some of the accuracy of these events disputed by historians, but it's all we have. Uh, and when you look at the totality of it all, the truth mixed with fiction, it paints the picture of a truly remarkable life. Maybe not a good life, uh, as we will see, but certainly a very noteworthy life. It all comes together to paint a fascinating portrait of a very powerful man, a ruthless but brilliant dude. Before we dig into the life of Shaka Zulu and the history of the Zulu people, let's first look at the history of the country that they thrived and battled in, South Africa. And touching on South Africa's rich and fascinating history, we'll then get into the culture and history of the Zulu people before we jump into a bloody spear-filled time-suck timeline. South Africa may be where meat sacks started being meat sacks, diverging from the ancestors we shared with monkeys and apes. It might be where the first dude stood up tall and proud to play with his weenie instead of sitting on a branch or in the bushes to do it. You know, probably could have included a better example there of an important human first, but I like that one. South Africa certainly had some of the oldest records of human history. In 1994, a scientist found some early human foot bones that date to somewhere between 2 and 3.2 million years ago. Australopithecines. Australopithecines, a name that literally means southern apes, the first human ancestors we've discovered so far who walked upright. Uh, their fossil records have only been found in Africa, and many of their fossils have been found in South Africa. So people have been living in South Africa for at least 2 million years. Compare that to the current evidence we have for North America. Early humans believed to have showed up no more than 40,000 years ago. And compare all that to, you know, my jerk-off example I mentioned earlier, and, uh, you know, the soil of South Africa has, you know, seen a lot more dirt, so to speak, than the soil of, uh, of America. That was, that was unnecessary. I just wanted to needlessly throw that visual in your minds. Uh, for a few million years, South Africans lived very simply. They lived in small tribes of hunter-gatherers, living off the land, hunting ancient Africa's abundance of wild game, drinking water from the many clean springs, creeks, rivers, lakes, fishing, eating wild vegetables, roots, fruits, berries, etc. And then somewhere around 2,000 years ago, things changed dramatically. Most scholars seem to agree that extraterrestrials showed up and these ancient aliens supplied ancient Africans with dwellings built from laser cut stones, hamburgers, mashed potatoes, and super fast and cool looking remote controlled cars with 780 kilovolt brushless motors. And early South Africans quickly built up an empire based on the manufacture and trade of said RC cars, uh, which were mainly dune buggies with those 2.2 inch M4 whole shot tires. Uh, random trivia, RC Cola, actually named after this early, uh, you know, dune buggy industry. 
And around 200 years ago, no one would build or sell more premier remote-controlled, competition-ready electric motor dune buggies than Shaka Zulu, which is how he became known as the RC Dune Buggy King. Uh, no, wait. Uh, no, wait. No, 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 no. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's complete fucking nonsense. Uh, you would, you would have heard about that for sure already if that was true. No, about 2,000 years ago, things did change. It had nothing to do with dune buggies, even though that would have been fucking sweet. Uh, about 2,000 years ago, South African communities shifted from foraging for vegetation and hunting, trapping and scavenging for meat to growing their own crops and domesticating cattle. They domesticated cattle between 1,000 and 2,000 years ago. Northern Africans have been domesticating uh, them for about 10,000 years uh, or eight, you know, eight, 9,000 years earlier than the South Africans. Took a while for some wandering cows to make it all the way down from the uh, northern part of Africa to the southern tip of that enormous continent. Fucking, fucking cows! Not known for being real fast. Uh, Unguni cattle are a breed of cattle now indigenous to South Africa, derived from these first early, you know, cows making their way down to South Africa. Going to be a lot of cow talk in today's show. Uh, cows are very important to Shaka's people and the culture he arose out of. They were the closest thing to currency early 19th century South African tribes had. The more cows you owned, the wealthier you were, you, the, the better your status. Sounds a lot harder than carrying around your wealth in today's debit and credit cards. Shields of Zulu and their foes would wield in battle, made from the hides of these durable, highly fertile, disease-resistant, you know, breed of cow. And these cattle provided food, these, yeah, status, defense. Uh, the indoctrination, or in, excuse me, the indu- introduction of agriculture, arguably the single most important event in world history, and the herding of cows, led to the first sedentary societies, towns, and cities in the world a few thousand years uh, earlier. And now the societal shift was coming back home to where human life may have started. Ancient hunter-gatherers called the San people settled down with some cows in what is now modern-day Botswana. And then their population grew and spread throughout the western half of South Africa. The Khoikhoi, which means men of men or the real people, they were a group of early cattle herders who often you know, con- conflicted with the San. Both San and Khoikhoi were already in South Africa when the Bantu-speaking farmers arrived 2,000 years ago. Between 200 BC and 200 CE, the ancestors of the Eastern Bantu speaking people migrated to Eastern and Southern Africa from the North after originating three to 4,000 years ago in the West Central African area of present day Cameroon. They cultivated sargum, millets, herded cattle, sheep, goats. They, manu- they manufactured iron tools and copper ornaments. As agriculturalists, agriculturalists, uh, these farming people lived in semi permanent homesteads comprising a uh, pole and daga, aka wattle and daub houses and grain bins arranged around animal buyers. I'd never heard of an animal buyer before. I had to look up his definition. I had to look up a lot of definitions today. Uh, this, this one means cow shed. And that word combo is so funny to me. It's cow shed. That's uh, back by the cow shed. Dad, where do you want me to put that wheelbarrow? I'm done. Uh, set it next to the cow shed, son. Put it in between the cow shed and the chicken coop behind the dog house and in front of the ant farm. I realize that's not that funny. I just like animal combinations with human things. I like adding animal names in front of dwellings normally associated with humans. Does it surprise anyone to hear that The Far Side was my favorite comic strip growing up? By far. Gary Larson. Ah, one of the best to ever do it. That great Seattle mind loves to humanize animals. Uh, Back to getting our heads around South African history. Located at the junction of Botswana, Zimbabwe, and South Africa, the Shashe and Lompopo rivers became the Nile of South Africa during the Middle Iron Age. Uh, regular flooding this time made intensive agriculture possible, not only people farming for their own families, but it also made possible uh, to grow surplus crops for the community to trade and save. The resulted population increase this created, along with surplus trade from the Indian Ocean, gold and ivory trade, uh, led to the development of the Mapungue, the first city and kingdom of South Africa. The name means Hill of the Jackals to some locals. It means place of wisdom to others, and it means the weasel emporium and juice bar to no one. Civilization existed sometime between 950 CE and 1300 CE. The old city's remains found by farmers not that long ago, 1933. They found the remains of stone walls, loads of gold idols and jewelry and more, and I'm guessing not all of it was donated to museums. Uh, Shortly after the abandonment of Mapungue, around 1300 CE, the ancestors of the present-day Suto, uh, Suto, and uh, t- uh, Tswana, Tswana, there we go, moved south to East Africa or from East Africa. Somewhat later, uh, Sutu, Tswana, uh, those people moved south into a large part of what is now South Africa's Hauteng and the Northwest provinces. About 100 years earlier, the ancestors of the Unguni people, uh, speaking people, Shaka's ancestors, moved from East Africa into the KwaZulu Natal region. 
around 1450 CE, a few northern Unguni moved up into what is known as the Free State Province, an inland plateau, and built circular settlements. These Unguni people would move across the Vaal River into the hilly areas of Hautang and the northwest provinces, introducing the stone building practice to the Sutu uh, Tuswana people. And then over 350 years ago, Whitey showed up. Hello, section of somewhat easier to pronounce names. Noice! The first white explorer showed up in 1488 when the Portuguese explorer Bartholomew Diaz became the first European to anchor off the coast of present day South Africa. And then King John II of Portugal appointed him to sail around the southern tip of Africa in the hopes of finding an ocean based trade route to India. Everyone's trying to get to India back then in 1486. He made it around the Cape of Good Hope. Africa's southernmost tip, which he named the Cape of Storms. Then he got lost in the Indian Ocean, circled around for a while, turned back, sailed home to Portugal after throwing down a stone cross on the Cape on his way back to mark his passage. Remnants of that cross found in 1938. Uh, he would also die near the Cape in a storm on a later vo voyage. His first name choice, Cape of Storms, pretty apt. Uh, the Cape was renamed the Cape of Good Hope by King John II because it represented the opening of a route to the east. Portuguese would first make it around the Cape to India successfully in 1500, but they didn't actually explore South Africa. Might have waved at some very confused dudes and ladies on the beach, but they didn't stop. And how weird would that be if you were on the beach and some white sailors floated by, just didn't even stop? People who looked so different than anyone you'd ever seen, <laughs> right? Anyone that in, in their tribe had ever seen. It's like, that would be the equivalent to seeing Sasquatch or aliens. If no one else was with you, who would even believe you? Oh, white warriors, huh? In a floating city. Okay. Sure you saw them, Thaddy. And I just rode here on a grasshopper the size of a horse. What's a horse, Funani? Uh, good question. I don't know. They haven't made it to this part of Africa yet. Probably, probably should have said zebra in that example. Uh, Europeans would leave South Africa relatively untouched for another 150 years. The Dutch would then arrive at the Cape of Good Hope for settlement purposes in 1652. The Dutch East India Company established a resupply station at Cape Town for its fleets traveling between Holland and its empire in South and Southeast Asia. The Dutch created the first white settlement in South Africa, the founding of what would become Cape Town. Six years after settlement, it had only 360 people. Now it has over 4 million. Beautiful city. Uh, some of it, much of it also uh, sprawling, deep poverty. Uh, the Cape would remain under Dutch rule from 1652 to 1795 when it would fall to the British. Uh, and then again, from 1803 to 1806, it would be under Dutch control, and then it would fall again to the British. And then it, uh, while it earned its full independence from Britain in 1961, uh, really in 1931, it's a bit complicated, South Africa remains part of the British Commonwealth to this day. Now let's back up to the Dutch landing in 1652, when employees of the Dutch East India Company landed, the VOC for short, that acronym plays in Dutch. Uh, the VOC quickly set up some crude shelters and planted vegetable gardens and orchards. You can actually see exactly where they first did this if you live in or ever visit Cape Town. Go to the company's garden park located in the middle of the city. Uh, when the local Khoisan peoples refused to provide goods on terms set by the company, when they weren't interested in being ripped off by the Dutch, the Dutch took up arms and drove most of the local population into the interior. And uh, that started, you know, a long, long history of battling with the locals. Going forward in place of local producers, the company relied on a combination of European farmers, mostly former employees of the company, and imported African slave labor to work the land that had been seized from local residents. How weird is that? The Dutch brought in slaves from other parts of Africa, mostly uh, West Central Africa, to work their plantations essentially in Southern Africa. Uh, when early Dutch farmers known as Boers attempted to es uh, escape some... Mo uh, it's attempted to escape some monopolistic, there we go, trading practices and autocratic rule by the VOC by moving into the interior. The company prohibited further expansion, temporarily ending the emigration of Europeans to the Cape, and they expanded the use of slave labor. So it wasn't this big mass continual migration. A few people went down there and they kind of cut it off for a while. Uh, and interesting that Cape Town was originally a true company town, by the way. Like this company ruled it. A few hundred French Huguenots fleeing religious and political per persecution in Europe, they would arrive in Cape Town in 1688 and 1689. Uh, they were then assimilated into local Dutch culture. More Dutch settlers uh, would also trickle in over the next century. And then, as I said, the British invaded the Cape at the end of the 18th century. Why? Well, because of war in Europe. Holland had been taken over by France, and the Prince of Orange, William V, was living in Britain in exile. And this dude, through many European royal marriages before him, had several titles. 
Uh, this is complicated. This shit comes up so much in Europe. So many examples of fucker so-and-so being the prince of this country and the duke of this other country and also the second line to the throne in this third nation, but also some baron or earl of this court, which gives him an outside shot at getting his other fourth crown, et cetera, et cetera. It's also very Game of Thrones, thanks to so many wars and so many marriages. Uh, who is supposed to rule which nation? Often very ambiguous, very up for debate. And all the various legitimate and quasi-legitimate claims led to wars for the crown, which when settled would often lead to more arranged political and royal marriages, which would then further confuse bloodlines and claims to thrones, which would then lead to more wars because everybody had to have their son be the king. So Captain Dickhead, a.k.a. William V, was the ruler of, the, of Orange, a principality in the south of France. And he was also a ruler of essentially the Netherlands. It's again complicated. And not worth digging into too far here. I'm going to try and summarize. In a nutshell, starting in 1780, France and Great Britain at war against each other in Europe uh, because, of course, they were. It's what they did. Europe prior to World War II couldn't go more than a few years without so much fighting. Uh, they were still fighting war and, you know, having war in North America due to some kind of revolution you've probably heard of. And now they wanted to fight in some more places because with expanding, uh, with an expanding known world, there were just, you know, so many more places to fight, fight, fight. The Netherlands, a.k.a. the Dutch, were allied with the French at the time. And a small garrison of French troops was sent to the Cape of South Africa in 1784, a vital geographic point when it came to lucrative trade with India, to protect it against the British. Uh, man, ever think about how many wars have been fought outside of Europe because of wars being fought inside of Europe? So much fighting in North America, South America, Asia, and Africa over the years because of European wars. It's, it's insane. Anyway, some French troops left for South Africa to protect it for France in 1784 because France and the Netherlands were friends, kind of. Then in 1795, the Netherlands were invaded by France as Napoleon began to make a name for himself as a battlefield tactician before he became an emperor. And the VOC fell into complete financial ruin during this uh, war. So maybe not great friends. Then the Prince of Orange fled to England for protection, who then helped establish the Dutch Batavian or ba Batavian Republic, basically a new Netherlands, because why not fuck the map up some more? European map makers in high demand for centuries. Due to the long time it took to send and receive news from Europe, uh, the Cape Commissioner in South Africa at the time in 1795 knew only that the French had been making or taking territory in the Netherlands and that the Dutch, because of this, might change sides on the war at any moment. And then British forces arrive at the Cape bearing a letter from the Prince of Orange, a legitimate letter, asking the commissioner to allow British troops to protect the Cape from France now until the war. The British informed the commissioner that the prince had fled to England. And again, this was true. But the Dutch in South Africa, they don't know if they can trust him. The Prince of Orange not on the boat. If only someone had a cell phone. Uh, the reaction to the Cape Council is mixed. Or were they still on France's side or were they now on England's side? They didn't know. And how strange to literally not be able to verify that. Not inside a few months anyway. They couldn't make up their mind. And then the British got tired of them waiting uh, you know, to make a decision. And then they did what they used to do so often. They just fucked them up. They attacked them. And the British successfully invaded the Cape in the Battle of Meisenberg and took it over. And the arrival of these new rulers and the legislative changes they made added to existing tensions between local settlers and metropolitan rulers and also widened an existing racial divide between whites and blacks. The British would give South Africa back to the Dutch in a short-lived peace agreement in 1802 between Britain and France. And then just four years later, they were like, JK, motherfuckers! And they just, uh, you know, took it again. 5,000 British troops took on just over 2,000 Dutch troops and obliterated them. And this obliteration had nothing to do, sadly, with the Dutch not being able to fight very well because they were wearing wooden shoes, you know, which was where, I, where my mind went first. I was like, maybe they couldn't fight that well because they had wooden clogs on. And for some reason, that's very funny for me to think about. Probably funnier than it should be. I just pictured Dutch soldiers not being able to maneuver very well in battle because it's hard for them to run around in clunky wooden clogs. And they definitely couldn't hide from anyone in these wooden clogs. And then to add another Dutch stereotype, this nonsensical picture, uh, I like to think about their defensive buildings being cute Dutch wooden uh, windmills and it being really hard for them to uh, shoot defensive shots because they have to wait for the blade to spin past, kind of like a miniature golf situation, you know? And then when they accidentally shot the windmill blade, then they'd fucking stomp around in anger and their noisy wooden shoes. Anyway, that's nonsense. Uh, Britain would remain in charge for over 100 years and really continue to have influence to the present day. They're still involved in South African politics through the Commonwealth. Uh, during 19th century British rule, the discovery of valuable minerals, diamonds in 1867, gold in 1866 would change South Africa, dramatically altering its economic and political structure. 
The growing mineral industry created ever greater divisions between British and Boer, white and black, rich and poor, brought in more white financial opportunists, exploited more black workers. And there's a ton more we could get into talking about South Africa, uh, but Shaka Zulu, that's why we're here. So many side roads to go down. It's easy to get lost. Uh, let's pivot over to the Zulu nation now. Now that we know a little bit about the history of South Africa, let's dig into the history of the Zulu people. Today, it's estimated there are roughly 60 million people living in South Africa in total. And the Zulu people make up about uh, 23% of this number, almost 14 million people. And while the country is a democratic republic, the province of KwaZulu-Natal, keep talking about these provinces. Uh, there's uh, nine South African provinces. I think uh, states, like the United States. Uh, this one that has a monarchy inside of it, the Zulu nation, specially provided for by the country's constitution. Today, Goodwill uh, Zwilathini is the king of Zulu nation. He doesn't have any real national political power, but he does hold considerable influence among the more traditional Zulu people in the province. Think of the Queen of England. You know, if more people in England actually gave a shit about what she thought uh, as far as how the country should be run. And if she got to own, say, the city of Manchester and help decide how people in that city live. So maybe she's not the best analogy, actually. Uh, while not as well known in the Western world, the Zulu king has more power in South Africa than the Queen of England does in England. Uh, the Zulu king is, a, is the chairman of a trust established to administer the land traditionally owned by the king for the benefit, material welfare, and social well-being of the Zulu nation. And this is a lot of land. This land consists of 32% of Kwa, KwaZulu-Natal which amounts to roughly 11,000 square miles. Uh, for maybe better comparative purposes, um, think about this as kind of like an American tribal reservation, but uh, still different because, you know, his title running it comes with a lot of money and privilege. It's hard to come up with a good analogy. It's a very unique situation. Uh, this dude, this king, doing pretty well for himself. The 72-year-old has 27 kids, six wives, mansions, lives a lavish lifestyle, gets paid over 1.2 million rand a year, which is not as much as it might sound. That's uh, actually worth around 80,000 US dollars. But he also gets put in charge of a $72 million uh, Rand annual budget in a notoriously corrupt nation where government officials routinely pocket some of that budget money, pillage some state coffers. When I was in South Africa, some of the people running the now defunct Nando's Comedy Festival I was performing and uh, talked about bribery just being part of the cost of doing business in South Africa. I was pretty much culturally accepted uh, and definitely expected Numerous people I was working with bribed local law enforcement, uh, you know, officials or, or like uh, customs agents to get luggage out of out of customs or, you know, they bribe law enforcement to get out of parking tickets, bribe officials to get permits to do this or that all the time. It was nuts. Uh, the largest urban concentration of Zulu people is in the Hauteng province and in the cities of Peter Martsburg and Durban. Now, the Zulu are the biggest ethnic group of black Africans in South Africa. Uh, one of many groups the nation has 11 official languages, 11. And that's just the official languages. How many are spoken in total? Who knows? A lot of Indians, Asians, various Europeans, different tribes moving in and out of the country from various other African nations, fleeing various dire economic situations, civil wars, etc. It's a different world over there. Uh, the four major ethnic divisions among black South Africans are the Unguni, uh, Soto Saswana, uh, Shangana, Tosonga, and the Venda. And within each of these divisions, various tribes. Zulu are Unguni, then there's the Kosas, the next biggest ethnic group in South Africa, comprising 17% of the total population, also Nguni. Uh, the third biggest, the Soto, a.k.a. the Basotho, part of the Soto Taswana group. I come to about 20 sources, no joke, and none will list exactly how many distinct tribal subgroups exist in South Africa right now. Four major African ethnic groups, uh, at least 17 different subgroups, of which the Zulu are one and again the biggest. An extremely diverse nation. Uh, the language of the Zulu people uh, is the Southern Bantu language of the Nguni branch. It has about 12 million native speakers, many of whom inhabit the province of KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, the word Zulu means sky, and according to oral history, Zulu was the name of the ancestor who founded the Zulu royal bloodline in about 1670. The story of the Zulu people's founding, fascinating, and it's, it's the legend into which Shaka, Shaka Zulu will be incorporated as a chosen one figure. So let's get into it for our timeline here. Before they joined with neighboring Natal Nguni under their leader Shaka in the early 19th century to form a Zulu empire, the Zulu were but one of many, many Nguni clans. The story of the Zulu begins, as I said, around the year 1670, when Malandela, the leader of one such clan, and his two sons, Zulu and Kwabe, left his homestead near the source of the White Umfalazi River and migrated to the southeast. Malandela's clan of about 200 men, women, and kids 
search for new land, new land on which to live, where they could tend to their Unguni cattle and goats. They headed down the deep, broad valley of the Umfalazi River towards the lowlands of the coast. They knew the route would be difficult since the terrain was rough and rocky. Not only that, but they anticipated being intercepted by violent rival clans. Many smaller clans already scattered along the river, tending to their herds of cattle and fields of sorghum and pumpkins amidst the uh, acacia scrub and rocks. That's right, pumpkins. I was surprised to have pumpkins show up in this suck. I didn't know there were pumpkins in Africa. Not sure why that surprised me. Turns out there's uh, over 700 different kinds of pumpkins in the world. Uh, bands of intruders like Malandela's clan never welcome in other clans' territories. A clan might show an individual traveler hospitality, but a group of several hundred migrants who wanted pasture for their cattle to graze, definitely unwelcome. I get it. You know, you have one friend or relative show up for dinner unexpectedly. Okay, fine. Maybe annoying, but probably have enough, you know, food for an extra plate or two. You have 200 unexpected guests show up, get the fuck out of here. Don't make me grab the gun, all right? Don't make, don't make me pump the shotgun. Get out of here. Go find your own food. And uh, Malandela's clan, especially unwanted, his ancestors had fought with a neighboring tribe so violently once that those people, the Lembe, called Malandela's father a uh, Lufenwenja, which meant penis of a dog. Mm-hmm. So old son of dog dick. For sure not an honored guest when he and 199 of his friends and family showed up in the neighborhood. Malandela was feisty. The only reason he was the leader of the clan he was uh, leading was, be, was because he was feisty. So he really didn't want him showing up. He became leader when he was a younger man. Uh, his cattle had been raided by the Lembe. They destroyed his stone cattle enclosures twice, and Malandela wanted to go back and get his cattle, maybe slap around those who took uh, messed up his uh, stone enclosure a, you know, a bit. But the elders of his clan were reluctant. They didn't want to cause trouble. They didn't want to rock the boat. Malandela felt that they were cowards, so he decided to go form his own clan. Many of his poorer neighbors, as well as his two sons and their families, those like him who were not afraid to fight for what they felt was right, they followed him. And Malandela was ready to fight. We will be among strangers for much of the way, he told his sons, according to the oral traditions. Check your fighting sticks and sharpen your blades. We must be prepared for any difficulties that might arise, i.e., get ready to stab some fuckers, guys. We're not asking anyone's permission to invade their little patch of land. Malandela also consulted the spirit world heavily before his journey, hoping a combination of divine blessings and physical strength would allow them to proceed unimpeded. To gain the spirit's favor, Malandela and his sons fasted, sacrificed a prized ox, and refrained from having sex. Instead of sleeping next to his beloved wife, Malandela slept in a cold hut with no fire. Fair. Always a little feistier when you got blue balls, when you're horny. Malandela truly pulled a real, uh, be gone, Lucifina. Probably easier to spear some dude when you haven't come in several weeks. Uh, these preparations allegedly called the spirits to them. In his weakened state, Malandela was visited by his dead father, by the spirits of his other direct ancestors. Zulu, his son, saw spirits dancing inside their hut. Uh-huh. Maybe they saw ancestral spirits. Or maybe they were just really tired or dehydrated. Maybe they ate the wrong kind of root or something. So many people in the socks we've done get talked to by God or by spirits. Why is anyone talking to me? Probably need to uh, do shrooms a lot more often. And probably take a lot more of them. Uh, the spirit of Malandela's great-grandfather called Malandela's attention to Zulu in particular, saying, Do you see your son? Regard him well. For from his line will one day come a male child born of the sweet one who will raise your house to majesty across all the lands. Interesting myth making here. Some legend building. Setting up the, uh, the rise of Shaka Zulu. Interesting folklore. Another ancestor, Malandela's grandfather, uh, Matangwa, added, but it will come only after great anguish for he must forge a will of iron and confront many dangers. Joining the chorus of spirits, Malandela's father said, and they shall be known as the Zulu people. And then Mandela and his clan started their journey. Malandela led the central group with the two other seniors marching close behind him, all fully armed. Two other groups of younger men scouted ahead, led by Zulu, his son. Malandela was armed with his uh, asagays, slender iron-tipped hardwood spears. You've likely seen pictures of men holding these spears if you've ever seen photos of uh, African warriors holding spears or even carvings of African warriors, common type of spear. Uh, the women and children followed the men. The women carried woven baskets of sorghum pumpkins. There's those fucking pumpkins again. Uh, or melons balanced delicately on their heads, while some also had babies strapped to their backs. Because the cattle needed to graze and the tribe members needed to hunt and forage, progress was very slow as the group forged its way down the rugged valley of the Umfalazi River. What a shitty way to travel. It's like the Oregon Trail, right, if the pioneers didn't have wagons or horses. Just literally had to carry everything. I mean, moving sucks now. Anyone who's ever moved knows that. But now imagine moving without a moving truck or any kind of truck. 
or a car or cart or even moving boxes. Ah, no thanks. Uh, at night, the tribe collected dry brushwood to form rough enclosures for the cattle. And in the morning, they'd have to break it all down and move it, move on again. Sounds so fun. Uh, as they traveled, there were Bushmen or San who lived in the caves of the deep river valley cliffs they had to avoid. Uh, there were bands of hunters known as the uh, Abattois, aka the Pygmies. Abattois, known to fight with arrow t arrows tipped with poison that would quickly kill their targets. Fucking what? Is this uh, South Africa or Lord of the Rings or Star Wars? What's going on here? It's like they had to make it past, you know, past uh, Tusken Raiders, angry Ewoks. And why weren't more people using these poison arrows and ditching their spears? Great question. Sounds like a way better weapon. I don't understand why those things didn't catch on more. Hey, what do you think about upgrading to highly lethal poisonous arrows? No, I like the spears. I like these unwieldy spears. I'd rather carry, you know, like one, just throw it one time, kind of hope for the best. Instead of being able to shoot, you know, multiple times, you know, with a much more lethal weapon without ever having to retrieve anything and, you know, making it a lot harder for me to kill. No, I'm, I'm good with the spears. Uh, not only did Malandela and the Zulu or in Zulu, excuse me, and their people have to worry about other aggressive tribes, poison arrows and such. They also had to worry about wild animals, lions, I and their cattle and them. You know, they had to keep the lions away by making these giant bonfires all the time. This, this trip really sounds like a huge pain in the ass. You know, that's another thing. The, uh, the Oregon, uh, the Oregon trail pioneers didn't have to fucking deal with lions. I mean, yeah, there's bears and stuff, but I feel like lions are worse. Hyenas smaller and sneakier than lions. Also a constant menace. It would make off with goats in the middle of the night, depleting the tribe's meat supplies. Finally, the tribe arrives at Babanango, where they found fertile and level land on which they could cultivate crops. There's now a town at this site. They sailed there for a time, planting small fields of millet and sweet tubers known as uh, madumbis, similar to like sweet potatoes. For shelter, they built rough grass huts. Neighboring tribes weren't as violent as their name-calling former neighbors, the Lembe. So it seemed like a, you know, a, a nice place to, to be. They had a little time of peace and contentment, but there was trouble brewing behind the scenes. Kwabe, Malandela's oldest son, had grown jealous of Zulu, his younger brother. It seemed like uh, Malandela openly showed a preference for Zulu and that Zulu would be made Malandela's only heir. It seemed like this because Nozinja, Malandela's wife, uh, had urged her husband to give the best of their white cows to Zulu so that he could build up his herds in preparation for one day becoming the clan's leader. He's got more, more cow talk already. Uh, Malandela knew this would cause problems between his uh, two sons, but he did it anyway. He gave Zulu this prized white cow. Malandela then gave Kwabe a brown cow, which is a fucking piece of shit cow. It was a symbol of inferiority. It really was. And because of this, the two sons began to avoid each other, and a big feud starts brewing. Kwabe got his fucking cow dissed. Got the old brown cow, fuck you. No white cow for you, Kwabe. You're a brown cow son if I ever had one. I love imagining this dude bitching about his inferior cow. This, this cow like situation really was a big deal for these guys. You know, just Zulu walking by. Hey, Kwabe, how you doing today? Fuck you, Zulu. Must be nice with your sweet ass white cow. I'm doing terrible. You, I even look at my brown cow. Everyone makes fun of me. Uh, soon the brothers had more to deal with in cow drama. Their neighbors eventually grew unhappy with them and their whole tribe probably over some other kind of cow situation. Neighboring tribes started accusing Malandela's people of witchcraft, uh, making some crazy unfounded accusations. You know, those accusations used to be witchcraft today. They're QAnon posts. Uh, the more things change, huh? Uh, one morning, Malandela finds several wooden stakes hammered into the ground around the homestead with uh, muthi or magical medicine smeared on them. Mm -hmm. And one of their prized cows had been injured and put into a pit. Gotta imagine, chief, don't fuck with my cows. Malandela not happy about all this. Small group of armed men start to follow Malandela's people around, prompting Malandela to order his sons to guard the land at night. Things are getting tense. It's clear the tribe needs to move on, so they pack up. They head down into the valley south of the Umfalazi River. They were outnumbered by this other group, so they had to go. While moving, the tribe fragments into three fractions, or three factions now. One led by Kwabe, another led by Zulu, another led by a third faction, uh, avoided taking sides with either brother, and they followed a warriorish guy named Petey Hugs and stuff. Oh, Petey. He doesn't get talked about enough. Oh, Petey hugs and stuff. Wasn't the bravest or the strongest warrior. Definitely not the fiercest, but he was super likable. And he was, he was sweet. And he was able to turn your frown upside down. You know, unless you were attacked, then he was, he was fucking out of there. He'd run. He's fast. Uh, and he also wasn't real. No, Malandela had, uh, they, they were just one, another group that just went on, went on their own. Malandela had no idea what to do. Hope things would work themselves out. Then Kwabe confronted his 63-year-old father. Monandela was sitting down eating some sorghum bread when the young man approached him with uh, followers watching from a distance. Speak, my son, the chieftain said. And Kwabe said that he was angry over the whole cow debacle. 
The cow drama continues. As the oldest son, he argued, I should get the white cow, not Zulu. Malandela not going to back down. He stood up standing much taller than Kwabe, and he said, Nozinja, or, or Nozinja is my great wife. It was her cow, for I gave it to her. The heifer now belongs to Zulu. And Kwabe was pissed, exclaiming, so you have chosen Zulu. His father responded, there has been no choosing yet. Now go, let that be the end of it. But it wouldn't be the end of it. You know that. The two men glared at each other before Kwame stalked off, followed by his faction. I gotta say, when I picked this topic, I never thought for a moment there would be any cow drama, let alone this much cow drama. As the party moved down from the Mufuli River towards the uh, Malatuze, or Malatuze River Valley, several members saw a patch of wild melons. Tired of in, the infighting, tired of all this cow drama. They just decided to fucking do their own thing. They decided to stay with these melons and just, you know, settle down. During the following weeks, the melon foragers established a small village and they called themselves the Amaungdini clan, meaning those amongst the melons. Okay? Didn't expect that either. Didn't expect this old melon twist in the story. Not the most intimidating clan name. Hope they never had to deal with too many attackers. Those amongst the melons. Doesn't sound like the fiercest warriors. I bet Petey Hugs and stuff belong to that clan. Malandell and his remaining followers, they trudged southwards into the Mlatuze River Valley. They camped on the fertile lands of a low ridge on the south bank. They built a homestead named uh, Odwini, which means the nest of the bees. Sounds shitty. Not nearly as comfy as the melon patch. A lot more stingy. But the little settlement uh, actually was good. It flourished. Okay, fine. Uh, Nuzinja and the other women planted fields of sorghum there. Wild melons. A lot of melon talk. Sweet potatoes. Their herds and flocks grazed on the grasslands beside the dense reed beds of the Malatuze. The men hunted elephant, hippopotamus, and buffalo, as well as antelope and birds. The community, well supplied, grew in numbers. It seemed like everything was getting good again. And then Malandela fell ill. Asking everyone to leave his hut, he spoke to his son Zulu. He said, You, my son, will be a great leader, and they shall call you uh, Nkozinkulu. I probably just butchered that. Uh, I listened to someone say that on YouTube probably 10 times. And after three or four of the times, I said out loud, fucking what? And I gave up. Uh, Malandela said, there shall be many after you, but there will come another, one of your de descendants. He will endure great hardships. He will have a will of iron. He will live by the blade of the Asagai. Asagai. He will make your descendants a mighty people, a, as great in number as the grass in the fields. So obviously it's Shaka Zulu. And then Malandela dies. After his death, his sons began to fight again. They trade insults and threats until the clan finally splits for good. Zulu probably tossed in one too many cow insults Kwabe's way. You know what dad's last words were, right, Kwabe? What, Zulu? What were they? He just said, you know, to me, he just said, I'm just, I'm so glad you got the white cow. He said Kwabe would have, you know, fucking lost it or something. He said, he said, he said, this isn't my words. He said, any, I quote, any silly asshole can take care of a brown cow. Everyone knows that. But to care for a white cow, he said, only a real man with a big brain and a bigger dick can care for that cow. That's, that, fuck you, Zulu, I'm leaving. G good, Kwabe. Don't forget to take your stupid brown peasant cow with you. No one wants that piece of shit. Uh, Kwabe took his followers off to the southeast, driving most of his cattle with him. Kwabe and his followers would settle in the Nagoya Hills near the lower Mlatuze River. They named themselves the Great Reed Bed of the Mlatuze. And they would have beef with the Zulu people for a long time, well into the 19th century. Long-lasting rivalry. Follow that whole cow debacle. Zulu took his followers to a low ridge between the Makumbai, uh, Makumbane, and the Zolo Rivers, where they had a good view of the surrounding hills. And there Zulu lived for many years as his clan expanded. Out of respect for his father, he went by uh, Nikozinkulu, which meant the great chief. And he established the Zulu lineage before he died around 1709. And according to oral tradition, Zulu's descendants, called the Amazulu, or the people of heaven, settled under the chiefmanship of Zulu's great-grandson, Nadaba Kampunga, the man of affairs, Nadaba Mampunga, uh, and his descendants were Zulu kings. The kings served many roles in the tribe. They were the center of agricultural and battle rituals, the main practitioners of the tribe's folk medicine. The king was in charge of bringing in the rains during times of drought, which seems like a very tough job. Had to make the harvest good. That must have been stressful. All right, everyone pissed at you when it's not raining. You're not doing a good job of bringing in the rain, out there fucking praying and dancing your ass off. You know, sacrificing a bunch of ox, but still no clouds, no dice. A uh, king was also the clan's treasurer. And when a king died, the tribe's people would leave the body to dry in a hut. Sounds nasty. Then they would burn, uh, you know, uh, special woods and bury the king with precious objects. And most importantly, they would not bury the king with his spears. Why not? Because if the king came back as a ghost to wreak havoc on the living for whatever reason, they didn't want the ghost to be armed. They believed that if the ghost 
was buried with the spears and you know, they could attack you with them in the afterlife. I'd never heard of that. I told a lot of, I've told a lot of ghost stories on the Scared to Death podcast. Never thought of that one. Never came across that one. Never thought of a ghost carrying around a ghost spear. That would suck. If I had the choice, I would rather be hunted by a spearless ghost. Rather get spooked than speared, for sure. Uh, one of the first Zulu kings, Jama, would build his capital village near the Mapembe River, just a little ways from where it combined with the uh, Mafofama or Mafofoma. Later, it would be named Nobamba, which translates to the place of unity. Nobamba would become an important site for the Zulu people. When Jama nicknamed the man with a stern countenance, that's, that's not a fun nickname. <laughs> Sounds like a real stick in the mud. When he died in 1781, his son, uh, Senzan Gakona, big character, was in his teens. Uh, Senzan Gakona would be Shaka Zulu's father. The oral traditions would say of him, he whose body was beautiful, even in the famine, whose face had no fault, whose eyes had no flaw, whose mouth was perfect. Got it. He was a male model. He was the Zulu Zulander. Uh, Senzan Gakona was a handsome and athletic prince. In the oral tradition of his people, he knew the legend that one of Malandela's descendants would become a great king. He hoped it would be himself. <laughs> Come on, please. And it wasn't. Uh, then he hoped he would father the chosen one. Senzan Gakona, along with other boys his age, had an, had an important job of watching over the tribe's cattle as a kid, as the uh, cattle meandered through pastures and valleys in search of grass to graze on. You know, back to cows now. Of course we are. Sometimes the cattle grazed on other tribes' land. One tribe, the Alan Ganey, got pissed about this. And they sent some emissaries over to the Zulu people to discuss uh, clearing up a little border skirmish. Before they could reach the valley, the emissary ran into uh, Senzan Gakona and his band of young herders. Senzan Gakona took on the negotiations. The two tribes managed to come to an agreement. The Zulu people invited the emissaries to a feast. During the feast, asked their guest about the Elongani women. Fuck yeah, they did. Nice. Uh, when the emissaries returned to their land, they spoke of the hospitable and very handsome prince who had taken a great interest in their women. And this got the girls talking. Several Elongani women, very intrigued. And by intrigued, I mean wet, probably. I mean, this was, after all, the Zulu Zoolander. One of them was Nandi Bebe uh, Elongani, Elongani, daughter of Bebe, a former chief. She decided she wanted to meet this handsome prince. So she undertook a four-hour journey to the Zulu's grazing territory, escorted by a group of girls, a chaperone, but they couldn't find any Zulus. So they went back to the village. A few days later, they returned without a chaperone. The girls settled a make at a makeshift campsite where they could spy on the handsome young Zulu herders. The young men discovered the women's hideout where the women were or where they were, and they decided to make some plans of their own. When the women arrived, the Zulu men surrounded them. Uh, they asked the women why they were there, and Nandi responded that they had come to meet the chief's son. But is that really why you have come here? One of the herders asked. Yes, to see the prince, Senzan Gakona, Nandi replied. Why do you wish to meet him? The herder persisted. Because he is hot as fuck. No, she didn't say it. She said, because I like him. But you don't know him. You don't even know who he is. She said, I know who he is. She probably winked when she said, oh, she said, I know who he is. Uh, and the herder responded, uh, we'll see. The men lined up, asked Nandi to identify Sendan Gakona. Sure enough, she did. And she declared that she wanted him as a lover. I knew it. I told you she was wet. Josefina told me. Uh, she led him to a makeshift shelter where they ate food, they drank beer, and most likely fucked a whole bunch of times. Not kidding. The other girls soon left. Nandi decided to stay with the Zulu prince. Uh, they were not even engaged. Uh, had this occurred in Europe, this would be a big scandal. Her virtue would have been gone. She would have been branded a harlot. Uh, not as big of a deal here. The Zulu people saw nothing wrong with premarital sex. Asterisks, kind of. They saw nothing wrong with a very specific form of what they considered to be premarital sex. This is kind of weird. They condoned a type of external intercourse, a form of coitus without penetration, allowed to unmarried couples. It was expected to occur at a time in young people's lives known as the fun of the roads. That's awesome. Uh, both people expected to keep a certain amount of self-control. The idea was that lovers would get to release some sexual tension, uh, but the woman would never get pregnant. Older women taught younger women how to avoid pregnancy with one of the techniques being squeezing one thighs together to prevent penetration. So it'd be like clitoral kind of stimulation, but nothing inside. Uh, they taught them how to be dry hump ninjas. And the men were taught to be thigh gap fuckers. Penetration before marriage? No bueno. A little bit, little bit of thigh gap fucking? All right. Uh, Nande and Zan, uh, Senzan Gakona were happy together, but then Nandi got pregnant. So they did a little more, they did a little more than thigh gap fucking. Somebody snuck up on in there. Uh, not good, not before marriage, and, and this led to them not being happy. It's a big scandal. Chief Mabengi, a uh, leader of the Alanganis, sent a delegation to confront the Zulus about their lack of dick control in this situation. The emissaries confront uh, Senzan Gakona, accuse him of being the father of Nandi's child, and then the Zulu regent, 
Mahuli, uh, or, or yeah, uh, speaking on behalf of him, denies that Nandi is pregnant. He says to them, and I love this. This is a quote from their oral traditions. She is sick with Ishaka, the beetle. That is all. Do not anger us with these wild stories. It is the girl's fault. However, if there were to be a child, we'd prefer it to be a boy. Now go. <laughs> What's nonsense? She's not pregnant. Her belly is swollen because of the beetle. However, if she is pregnant, and if she is pregnant, but she's not, but if she is, it's 100% her fault. She didn't squeeze her thighs tight enough, but she's not. But if she is, we'd like a boy. Now get out of here. Uh, love that an intestinal beetle is the go-to excuse here for a pregnancy. I wonder what other excuses for pregnant bellies people have made over the years. Uh, God quickly jumps to mind, right? How many women impregnated by God before Mother Mary? Uh, Zeus got a lot of ancient Greek women pregnant. Uh, the Zulu quickly reject Nandi and her unborn child. Uh, Sinzan Gakona uh, takes a different woman for his first wife, Molly. Uh, their first child, a boy, ends up dying young. Then they have a girl who survives. Sinzan Gakona's second wife uh, does not bear him any children. Meanwhile, Nandi has given birth to her son a long while ago. And Sinzan Gakona's wives still haven't given him any male heirs. And apparently this makes him angry with Nandi. Right? He has a son, but not an heir. And this son will lead us right into today's Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck timeline. July 1787, Shaka Zulu is born in the KwaZulu Natal. That's where it is today, province of South Africa. Since Zulu means heaven, the name he will come to be known as in the West Shaka Zulu, translated literally, means intestinal beetle heaven. Awkward. Uh, not exactly the coolest name for a ruler, but does sound cool when you say it in English. You know, we, well, when you say, I guess not in English, when you say it's Zulu. Shaka Zulu sounds cool. Uh, intestinal beetle heaven, not as cool. Uh, Shaka Zulu's birth causes problems for both his parents. The Elangeni refused to forgive Nandi for not closing her thighs tighter. And the Zulu began to doubt that Senga, Senzan Gakona will be a good ruler since he can't produce a legitimate heir. I shall make her regret the day she tricked me, Senzan Gakona tells Muli, uh, his regent. When the threat reaches Nandi, her response is immediate. She says, I shall call my child Shaka. A little callback to Nandi's obvious pregnancy being unconvincingly dismissed as an infliction of an intestinal beetle, known in Zulu medical circles as Shaka. Uh, Nandi decides to own this. She also knows that with the birth of her son, uh, right? These old rumors have been reignited. Maybe he's going to be the chosen one, Shaka Zulu, the chosen one. Senzan Gakona sends executioners to kill his child. So he could never interfere with a rightful heir should he have another son, but Shaka and his caregivers escape. As the years pass, Nandi and Shaka live in relative seclusion amongst the Elongani. Uh, they are ridiculed. They are ostracized. She's a tainted woman. He's a bastard son. Uh, on their own together, you know, socially, Shaka develops a deep love for his mom, a thick skin against insults that are flung his way. When Shaka is a small child, Nandi and uh, Sinzan Kagoa briefly reconcile. Uh, Sh uh, Sinzan Kakona's wife, Maccabi feels compassion for Nandi, one of his wives, and arranges for her and her son to live with them. Nandi becomes Senzan Gakona's third wife for a while. Apparently, they worked through his trying to kill both of them. Seems like that would be a little hard to get past. Right? Dif different times, I guess. Uh, second girl, or I'm sorry, second child, a girl named Nan Namkuba is born to them. But then their relationship falls apart again. Uh, the strong-willed Nandi begins to see her husband as a weak man, a pampered royal who only wants to father children and have many wives. Because Senzan Gakona ignores the prophecy about the Chosen One, it seems he has no plan to increase the Zulu people's power. At the time, the Zulu is you know, a small clan uh, in the uh, T uh, Tetwa Confederation. It's ruled by another king, Dingizwayo. Uh, Dingizwayo will eventually play a huge role in Shaka's life. Uh, as Shaka grows up, he begins to see that he's uh, never you know, really welcome in any of the various royal homesteads he and his mom live on. Also, Nandi determined to be treated like a Zulu queen. She remains steadfast in her, in her belief that her son is the chosen one. I shall be respected, and you, my little fire, shall one day be a great man. All shall tremble before you, she tells her son. And she was right about that. Many will tremble. Shaka, uh, allegedly a big kid as a child, real big, full of muscle, much bigger and stronger than other kids his age. Because of this, he's given the important task of herding a bunch of his tribe's goats by the age of just five or six. But then because he is... You know, bigger, not just a little kid. He loses a, a goat, loses a pet goat that belonged to his dad. And I guess dad fucking loved this goat. It was like dad's favorite goat. Some sources say this goat may have been eaten by a wild dog. And this leads to a big fight between his parents. Great. First, there was all the cow drama. We just start to get past it. Now we're into fucking goat drama territory. 
Nandi defends her son, saying he's just a little kid, right? To slip up is nothing, especially nothing in comparison to Sinzan Gakona's many failures as a leader. Yikes, things escalate quickly. Went from why can't the boy be better at watching goats to your fucking failure of a man. Uh, why do you let the Bethuzi and the Amakuni uh, harass and torment the Zulus? Nandi shouts at him. How can you allow the Bethuzi warriors to capture you and then ransom you for cattle? Like that's, that's some mess up that happened. And why do you allow the Zulus to remain in fear of their neighbors? Do not speak of the failures of my son. Look to your own. Well, this tongue lashing does not sit well with Senzan Kokona. It happens around 1803. Because of it, Nandi and Shaka are kicked the fuck out. Nandi's given the nickname Loud Voiced One. Mm-hmm. Kind of like a, like a Zulu Karen among the Zulu people. That nickname says a lot. Shaka's mom, not a wallflower, not a doormat. Quick, quick to ask to speak to the manager. Uh, carrying her infant daughter, leading Shaka, Nandi takes the long, dusty road back to the Ilan Ganey's lands, a road uh, she traveled first all those years ago when she wanted to see the handsome Zulu prince. This time, her return brings even deeper shame than her first go-round with the Zulu Zoolander. She now has to endure mockery for his, her son's illegitimate parentage and for being expelled from her husband's home. In the eyes of the tribe, she has ruined the Ilan Ganey's reputation. This woman will bring the end of us, predicts her father, Mabengi for she will be the ruin of the Elongani. Dude sounds like a drama queen. All right, so she ran her mouth a bit. A little bit of a Karen, but come on, calm down, Mabengi. Uh, the tribe made up songs to torment her. In response, Nandi doubles down on the idea that her son will be a legendary warrior. And, you know, she'll have her revenge on all these people. One day, my son, you'll be a great man, she tells him. You will be a respected king and military leader of many clans. You will fight at the head of many warriors. All will bow before you. She's really building up with confidence. Shaka uh, does well in this new home, uh, owing to his skills and physical size. He quickly graduates from herding goats now to herding cattle, even though he's much younger than the other boys he's working with with the cattle. Uh, but he is mercilessly taunted by the older boys. Apparently a favorite taunt they would throw towards him was, <laughs> this is a quote, your little penis is like that of the abattoir. And, and again, the abattoir being pygmy. So they call him pygmy dick. Nice. A little creative variation on micropeen. And herd boys, as they were called, wore no clothing at the time. So this, this really had to sting. Everything was on display. So if you, know, if you had a huge dick, this taunt wouldn't carry much weight. Wouldn't have made any sense. So the poor dude, at least as a kid, you know, maybe had a little baby wing. It's a rough period in history. Rough, rough place to have a tiny wing. Hard to blow off those taunts when you can't throw a sock in your boxers. Then throw some jeans on over that. Uh, they also give Shaka an old flea-ridden animal pelt to sleep under. It's all rotting, shitty emphasizing the fact that they did not consider him to be royalty. He was not a chosen one to them. Oh, he's old micropene flea pelt. No one wants to be micropene flea pelt. To torment him even further, the tribal elders give him the task of threshing millet, which was seen at the time exclusively as women's work. Then when he had cattle, other members of the tribe would take the best grazing land, wouldn't let Shaka's cattle access the good drinking water. The older and the bigger boys would drive Shaka's five cattle to the outskirts of the herds, leaving them to feed on scrubby grass and twigs. It's hard to keep him healthy on bad food like that. His cows, you know, grew skinny, didn't produce as much milk. It was shameful. Didn't have as much meat. More cow drama. It never ends. His cow shaming unintentionally helps Shaka grow strong. He ends up having to walk long distances to find his cattle food. You know, builds him up. Still, his older peers fuck with him. They make him do shit like uh, lick porridge off a spoon. They heat in a fire until it's white hot. It burns his tongue and mouth. In another instance, they tell him to dig a hole to retrieve some porcupine eggs, which are not actual eggs because porcupines still eggs it's vegetation uh and, and then as he digs you know in the soft earth with his hands he finds fresh human shit gotcha shaka nailed him you just got shithole. you just fell for the old that's not a porcupine egg hole that's a shithole prank i just took a dump in there ha <laughs> ha who hasn't fallen for that uh timer three uh, when he fights back with you know after getting shit on his hands they beat him with the reed switch well they beat him i guess he never cries or flinches which makes the boys beat him more are uh, the tribal elders apparently also cruel to Shaka? As a son of a king, he should have been given a proper food receptacle to eat out of, but instead he's fed dollops of hot bubbling milk curds ladled into his hands, which burn them. He knows that if he complains, he's going to be beaten, so he just endures the pain silently. They are creating a monster now, according to these legends, and uh, they will soon regret it. Nandi will tell Shaka, the one offended never forgets. It is the offender who forgets. Do not fear, my son. Our time will come. We must be patient. She wants revenge. Shaka soon becomes strong and capable, and then the tormenting slows down. But it's too little too late, motherfuckers. Not going to forget about that shithole anytime soon. After a while, only the biggest of the boys dare to taunt Shaka. 
The rest start to uh, open up to him, let him participate in their games. He excels in these games. Shaka excelled at this game where the, uh, the player would throw a knife at a big round melon, more melon talk, as it would roll down a mountain alongside a line of herders. If the stabber could hit the melon, he got to go to the top of the line of boys, a better spot and symbolically top of the herders hierarchy. Despite not even having reached puberty yet, uh, Shaka consistently ends up at the top of the line. He's always beaten the others. He's the best knife thrower. The former contempt and ridicule of, uh, ridicule of the other herders gradually turns to bitterness and jealousy. And then on one particular day, Shaka doles out his first ass whooping. He decides to make a pair of fighting sticks from these long, straight branches of a tree. He carries them while he's herding his cattle. Reminds me of being a little kid having like a wooden sword in the yard, you know, pretending to be this great warrior. But Shaka was, he was a little more committed to this role. This was uh, more of a realistic prospect for him. And then uh, these sticks come in handy when one of the largest of the village bullies, this kid named Bangwise, whose name meant fighting for land, uh, walks up to Shaka, grabs Shaka's fighting sticks, one of them, smacks him across the face with it. Very insulting. No one likes getting hit in the face with a stick. And then he, he says, so you, so, you, uh, so you who has come here in disgrace, you now have made fighting sticks. I suppose you are not afraid to use them. Now stand and fight. And Shaka does stand and fight. And he goes on to absolutely beat the shit out of this older, bigger dude. The fight's over in moments. He then look, looks at some other boys who had gathered around to watch this and says something along the lines of, who's next? Yes. A line straight out of an 80s action movie. He was like Zulu Steven Seagal, Chuck Zulu Norris, Pee Wee Zulu Herman. I don't know. Maybe not, that last one doesn't play. No one volunteers to fight him next. Shaka goes back to milking a cow and just, you know, feeling good about fucking dishing out an ass whooping. Old intestinal beetle heaven. He's done getting fucked with. No more sticking his hand in shitholes for micropene flea pelt. Uh, with this victory, things start to change for Shaka. The herd boys start whispering stuff like, he is as strong as an ox. He strikes with the speed of a snake. We should probably stop talking about his tiny wing. And people stop fucking with him. Having that little dick, that's what made him strong. Ha! That's why it's good to have one. <laughs> that's why it's lucky, right? I mean, it is cool if you have one, right? Uh, word of Shaka's accomplishments spread around the land, even into neighboring Zulu territory. Again, people start to wonder, is he the chosen one? And this all happens again before Shaka hits puberty. Uh, Shaka's puberty ritual leads to more drama. Uh, when Zulu boys at the time enter puberty, they would go through a ceremony in which, amongst other things, they'd be given special clothes to wear. The most important of this clothes is a rear flap of supple hide and a loin covering, usually made from the tail of a gennet, mongoose, or monkey. And when Shaka's time for the puberty ceremony comes, his father reluctantly summons Shaka to the ceremony and then gives him a tiny baby monkey tail for his loincloth. Gotcha again, Shaka! Here you go, micropene flea pelt. This teeny tiny little fucking floss thin strip of pelt. More than enough to cover up your baby dick. And everyone points and laughs. He runs away crying. No, just kidding. Uh, no, his mom tells him, be wary, my son. My eyes and ears here have also told me of talk amongst your brothers. There is great jealousy in their bellies. They are soft and pampered, but they have influence. You must take care. Thinking on what his mom said, he decides not to go. Why must I go back to that nest of hornets? He asks his mom. My own father has dishonored you. He rejected me. If I believed the loose tongues, he would have had me killed. I shall now not acknowledge him or my brothers. And this, you know, pisses his brothers off. This pisses his dad off. You know, he pisses off uh, Makadema, heir to the Elangani chiefmanship or chieftainship. Bangwise, the guy that Shaka had beaten in that stick fight, was Magadema's good friend. Magadema now becomes obsessed with proving his authority to Shaka. I am the chief's chosen heir, Magadema declares to Shaka one day. And I am a person of consequence. I expect to have respect and obedience from all others. That means you as well, he says. I have the rank to demand it. And then Shaka's like, dude, shut the fuck up. I'll beat your skinny ass with a stick. He didn't say that. Not those exact words, but he said something close. He said, but you don't have the ability to earn my respect. Do you forget so soon what happened to Bangwise? Mm -hmm, they probably winked. Ha, ah, gotcha. Then, later when they drank at the stream, Shaka provoked Makadema openly. Shaka refused to drink at a point on the stream below Makadema's spot. Instead, Shaka went upstream, knelt to drink there. And then just to fuck with Makadema, uh, Shaka stirred up mud in the water, which then floated down to Makadema. He got drank some mud water. And Shaka told him, you will not make me honor you above my mother. and You cannot break my will. And Makadema sounded like he kind of ran off crying. And he told the tribal elders and his parents about Shaka's behavior. Everyone saw it. He muddied my water. <laughs> he did it. I drank like a mud in my mouth. <laughs> we got to banish him. I hate micro peen flea pelt. He sounds like a little whiny crybaby. Tension in the tribe escalates. 
Then Shaka and Makadema, they get into a big snafu, some kind of weird argument. I, I ended up not trying to include it because it literally makes no sense to me. But the point is they got an argument. And then Shaka gets so mad in this argument, instead of stabbing Makadema, which he wants to, he just uh, he walks off and he stabs this nearby cow in a moment of rage. Dude had anger issues. I've been very mad many times. I've never been so mad. I've worried about just impulsively stabbing a random animal standing near me. Shaka stabs this cow during a famine and the cow dies. And this is bad news. This is inexcusable. The Elongani promptly disown Shaka and his mom now. They're banished from the Elongani lands. They're ordered to return back to the Zulus. Ah, cow drama. It's, just, it's constant. This is a weird story so far, right? But I like it. Uh, the Zulus hear about the cow drama. <laughs> Not kidding. They refuse to take him in. They're like, ah, we've, we heard about the fucking cow. You get out of here. You can't come over here. Shaka and his mom, they've been bouncing back and forth between these two tribes, Shaka's entire childhood, and now neither of these tribes want him. And then Senzan Gagona, Gakona, excuse me, takes it one step further and hatches another plan to kill Shaka before he leaves uh, Ilongani lands. This is the second time his dad's tried to kill him. Mabengi, the leader of the Ilongani, uh, apparently collaborates on this plan. Everybody wants him dead. And a group of Zulu assassins go out to kill Shaka, but Shaka is warned in time by someone friendly and makes an escape. He finds his mom. They scrap together some supplies. They head towards the coast now where the Kwabe people live. Fear is no part of it, Shaka tells his mom. The only thing now is courage. For four days, the refugees wind their way over hilly country to the southeast, and then a subclan of the Kwabe take them in temporarily. Some of Nandi's relatives are there. Nandi stays with the tribal leader, Nagandanyana, who receives her affectionately. I'm pretty sure I fucking nailed that word, by the way. Very proud of myself just for a few seconds. Shaka was now about 15 years old. Here, he starts to learn more about the strict social hierarchy that governs the Nguni peoples. Nandi and Nagandanyana, ah, it's trickier that time, soon have a son. They skip the thigh gap fucking. They get married, they go for the real thing. Things seem like they're going pretty well right now. But then a famine rages, and soon the chief's other wives are like, oh, we don't want Nandi anymore. And again, she was kind of a Karen. So she's probably, you know, not making friends. So they're like, ah, oh, we don't have enough, you know, food, too many mouths to feed, and they kick her out. <laughs> so she gets married. This chief comes with one of his wives, then doesn't get along with the other wives, and then, you know, they get bounced again. And they're told to go back to central Zululand. What the fuck is going on in the story? Homeless again. The three, uh, the, the three of them now, Shaka and his little si uh, sister, his mom, uh, they end up taking temporary refuge with another chief, uh, Gwani of the Emma Kunwini. And then Shaka's father tries to kill him a third time. He sends presents to this chief, asks that he arranges for assassins to kill Shaka, but the chief refuses. So the chief, chief sounds kind of nice right now. But then the chief also kicks out Shaka and his mom because his tale is insane. And there's that famine still going on. This is, <laughs> no one wants these fuckers. So now Nandi and her, and her children move on again, this time to the Tetwa land where Nandi's aunt lives. At this time, Tetwa, the throne, their throne is occupied by the aging chief, Job. Uh, he's dealing with the effects of the famine as well. Uh, he can't arrange for Nandi to stay there very long. Uh, he, he kicks him out, but he does send him to another, another person, to a friendly person named Nagomani, respected headman. Nagomani notices how much stronger and more athletic Shaka is compared to other boys his age, so he decides to take Shaka under his wing, and he and his mom now live in his village. Knowing that he would likely have to endure bullying again, Shaka secretly, secretly starts practicing daily with his fighting sticks now in a secluded spot in the woods. And he ends up beating several people's asses. He gets respected, and then he becomes feared. The young boys in this village start to advise one another, stay clear of the tall newcomer. He is unpredictable. He does not know the meaning of fear. And the next seven years uh, end up being probably the most stable of Shaka's life. Finally not getting banished. Finally, a little bit of stability now. No more cow drama for a second. This feels like a, uh, uh, a good spot to, to take another little quick sponsor break. He's finally able to focus on building those RC dune buggies. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about dune buggies for a second. Today's Time Suck is also brought to you by Shaka Zulu RC Dune Buggy King. This week... Get a double XLE 2.0 four-wheel drive desert buggy brushless RTR with smart fox body for just nine nine ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine rand. Okay, this is a big sale, it's a blowout. Normally a million rand. This thing can handle any and all South African terrain with a Spectrum Firma 4-pole 780 kilovolt brushless motor, Max's Creepy Crawler LT tires, aluminum shock towers, and updated front and rear bulkheads. With each purchase, you also get a free limited edition RC Cola smoking jacket and a signed and framed 8x12 inch photo of a really cool looking majestic white cow 
and a 20% off coupon to a purchase of any flying snake at, I think you know what's coming, Can Dummins House of Flying Snakes! Fuck yeah, bro! Woo! So come on down to the Shaka Zulu RC Dune Buggy King, located at 52 Samora Machel Street in Durban, across the street from Zahn's Business Opportunities and next door to Brown Cow Life Insurance. And that's all the sponsors for today. Uh, that, one, that one makes a lot more sense if you listen to General Butt Naked and Craigslist Killer Sucks. That was, that was nonsense. That made, that made me very happy. Back to Shaka now. Okay, so men, you know, he's got some stability. He's going to be in this place for several years. Uh, he starts to get along with people. Uh, the men of this village now start to teach him about the natural world as well as domestic and military affairs, the practice of the tetwa. All this information will come in much, you know, very handy later. The Gamani, uh, who had taken in Shaka under his wing, does the same with some other promising boys. You, and then he starts sending out a group of four or five of them to explore the area, the explore the coastal lowland region. They become familiar with the terrain and the people that live there. This is a central part of a young warrior's education, going out, meeting new tribes. Uh, the past issues of Shaka and his mom don't seem to matter to uh, to Job or his son, uh, Dingiz Wayo. Uh, Nogomani kept Dingiz Wayo up to date with Shaka's progress. Dingiz Wayo's support will play a huge role in Shaka's later accomplishments. Under Nagame's, Nagame's tutelage, Shaka spends a month exploring the coastal lowlands, studying the lifestyles of the locals, learning about their foods, medicines, iron making, trading practices, lifestyles. Uh, Nogomani once tells Shaka, you, Shaka, will one day have a great task to do in the West. I especially expect to hear no complaint from you. Learn about the customs of different people. One day you will rule over a great diversity. One day when you are a lion and no longer a cub, perhaps I shall bow the knee to you. But for now, listen and learn. And Shaka does learn, learns all kinds of shit. Learns how to use iron axes, various spears, fighting sticks, clubs, shields. He learns the various traditions, ceremonies, rules of etiquette, protocols, medical techniques, even the legal and ju uh, judicial processes of the people that he visits. He learns various combat techniques. And soon no one can defeat him in sparring matches. Well, no one can defeat him before, but now he's, like, he's, now he's even more powerful. He trains, trains, trains some more. Uh, this training is especially important because just north of them, the Netawande people, uh, who live under the dreaded ruler Zwide are growing more and more powerful, expanding their ter territory. Nande constantly reminds Shaka that he is, uh, you know, destined for greatness, has to prepare to be a leader. She tells her son, keep ever in your mind the spirits of the old kings of your lineage, for theirs is the power that will aid you in times of need. She lists out his ancestors, the important male ancestors, but she does not mention Shaka's father's name. Dude couldn't even keep his dick in a simple thigh gap. He's not going to get named now. He's tried to kill Shaka three times, so fuck him. Uh, in 1805, an assassination attempt on the aging chief Job is perpetrated by his two adult sons, Tana and Dingizwayo. Uh, then the, 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 Tana is assassinated. Dingizwayo escapes with a spear lodged in his back after this plot is discovered. Uh, that had to sting a bit. Getting an arrow stuck in your back would be a motherfucker, but a spear... That's going to mess your week up. Uh, Dingus Wild finds refuge in the foothills of the Drakensberg, uh, living amongst the Kwabe and the Langani people. One of his sisters nurses him back to health. The next year, 1806, while tending cattle, Dingus Wild runs into the white explorer Robert Cohen, sent inland from the Cape that year with an escort of indigenous soldiers known as the Khoi Khoi. Two wagons to find a route to uh, De La Goya Bay. Cowan had crossed the Orange River, South Africa's largest river, traveled north before swinging around east and entering the land of the Unguni en route to Delagoa Bay. Uh, Cohen was a surgeon, and records show he operated on the knee of a Hulubi chief with some success. Some success does not sound awesome. Better than no success, I guess. Shortly before, Dingus Wayo had heard about his father Job's death, decides to return home, claim the Tetwa chiefmanship. He also offered to guide Cohen's party to the east, leading the surgeon to the coastal lands. Uh, the journey is cut short when Cohen is burned to death within a hut somewhere in the land of the Kwabe. Whoops. You know, it sounds like it's probably an accident. You know, sometimes you go into a hut and you're fine. Other times you end up burned to death. That's, that's, a that's the real trouble with huts. The constant risk of getting accidentally burned to death. Uh, some speculated that Diz Dingiz Wayo killed Cohen and burned him alive, obviously. Uh, he came back riding a creature no one in the region had seen before, a horse, and he carried a brand new weapon and gun. What a, re what a return, showing back up with a brand new animal. Carrying a brand new weapon. Uh, Dingus Wayo arrives home to find the Tetwa's throne had been claimed by his younger brother, Mawewe, with his gun and horse. Wasn't hard for Dingus Wayo to take over, you know, shoot him. 
Having a gun and a horse when you're fighting someone with neither, it's a big advantage. The Spaniards proved that when they motherfucked Central and South American empires with their conquistadors. Um, away, away. Uh, yeah, yeah, he, he dies. Dingus Wayo now begins to assert his authority. At first, he rules over the Tetua. Then he sets his sight over the entire region, wants to take over a bunch of people. And he starts building up a federation, ends up building a federation of 50 tribes through a combination of diplomacy and warfare. Now the chief, Dingus Wayo, has a very capable young warrior at his side, PD Hugs and Stuff. Now he has Shaka Zulu, Mr. Intestinal Beetle Heaven. Though he's only 16, Shaka admitted to the circle of senior advisors. It's a great honor. And if the timeline seems a little confusing, sometimes these guys reference older and younger, it's because it is. It's because they were trying to combine various oral traditions into kind of one narrative. So sometimes people bounce around a little bit. Uh, but you get the gist of it. In one meeting, Dingus Wayo lays out his political aspirations to Shaka. He says, I intend to bring all domestic clan feuds to an end. I shall assert an overall military control over the area around the coastal lowlands and we shall penetrate further inland to the heart of the country. This strategy will end the incessant intertribal bickering that we now have. It is also necessary to stop the expanding Netwande, and we also need to pacify the Guani and Hulubi tribes to the north. The new chief begins to develop a powerful military force. He forms new units with distinctive names and uniquely colored shields. The formation of these new units reinvigorates the Tetwa. They begin to feel like a you know, cohesive, powerful tribe. Young men in the military start forming strong bonds to cut across clan or tribal rivalries. Their allegiance only now is to the king. This is new. But then neighboring tribes get similar ideas, start building little mini empires of their own. Zuide, who led the Netwande, uh, and then, uh, oh, this guy's name. No pronunciation guy was given. This guy is a special trick one. Pakatawayo, maybe, who led the Kwabe, and Matawane, who led the Netwande, a different faction, also busy building up their forces as well as fighting these military units, do all their own hunting and supply sourcing. They wear cow tails on their arms and legs, as well as on their chest and back. They have special kilts made of animal tails, thongs made from woven pelts, otter, leopard pelt flaps hang at the back of their heads. They have ear flaps made of monkey skin. That is quite an outfit. Man, when you see a dude coming towards you with a spear and ear flaps made out of monkey skin, you know he is fucking coming for war. Or... He's coming for a sandwich or he's coming to ask where to find the spaceship that has his dentures in it. He could be coming for a lot of things because he might be completely out of his mind. It's an, it's an interesting outfit. If you saw that now, it's an interesting outfit. Uh, with his new fighting force, Dingus Wayo begins his conquests. When he conquers a new clan, he drafts units from the losing army into his own army. A lot of monkeys dying around this time. Skin is in high demand. A lot of ear flaps need to be made. Dingus Wild plans marriages between he and his uh, women to ensure clan's loyalty to him, right? We've heard about this before. Genghis Khan did a lot of this. A lot of old conquerors did. You ensure loyalty by marrying women from a lot of different tribes that you've conquered. Probably, probably a great way to ensure a lot of different, you know, women are mad at you too. But then you have kids with them all. Now you're tied by blood to your conquered peoples. Uh, now let's take a minute or, or many uh, to describe how Dingus Wild's battles were being fought. This is so odd. This is, uh, we're going to talk about the kind of warfare being fought before Shaka, Shaka Zulu, excuse me, changes it all dramatically. Prior to Shaka, tribal warfare in this region uh, was largely non-fatal. Instead of like having a, like a, a battle that maybe we're used to when thinking about like European history or uh, basically the history of any other place in the, on earth, uh, Zulu soldiers for their battles would use these throwing spears. They would meet face to face on a preordained battlefield uh, at a preordained time but they would be a long ways apart from one another, like 100 to 145 feet, you know, from one another. These two groups of guys standing face each other, 145 feet away from each other, roughly, and they would just throw these spears at each other. Uh, very few close engagements with very little hand-to-hand -hand combat. They just line up and throw spears back and forth, often for many hours, until eventually one side would get sick of trying to dodge fucking spears. And then they would drop their weapons, and that would acknowledge their defeat. And fatalities were rare. More of like a dangerous athletic competition than a battle. Almost like a track meet match where you throw your javelin against the other team's javelin throwers. Very odd. Whoever lost, you know, they'd lose some of their cattle and they'd lose a little bit of land, you know. Uh, Shaka first served as a messenger in these battles, delivering food, shields, you know, spears, sleeping mats. Sometimes these things would last for days. Every once in a while, stick fighting would also come into play where people usually wouldn't, you know, not be actually killed. They'd just be beaten with a stick. And Shaka would get in there and do some of this fighting. He'd whoop some asses with some sticks. Uh, Dingus Wayo's favorite son was impressed by his battle skills, Shaka the warrior. And as soon Shaka and the young prince become friends, they even eat from the same bowl, which is a big honor. Uh, he's moving up in the world. 
Then around 1809, Shaka tries to talk Dinka's Wayo into changing up their battle strategy. He's like, what if we just kill these guys? Uh, you know, he thought it was incredibly ineffective just to throw spears and then let the enemy flee. When the enemy didn't just come back later to throw more spears. He's like, why don't we just fucking kill them? Then we don't have to worry about them again. And why don't we just uh, do some hand-to-hand -hand combat? And he starts uh, getting a little more aggressive in his hand-to-hand -hand combat in battle. He's, uh starts to try out some new techniques. He develops a bigger, heavier shield, one that uh, could be used to bludgeon opponents, not just as a defensive weapon, but as a striking offensive weapon. He has the region's best ironsmith fashion him a new type of spear that was used not to be thrown, but to kill uh, in short, ha short, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Spears of the area in the time were made by digging iron from surface deposits, melting it in clay furnaces, heated by goat skin bellows. Smith would uh, work the ore into points, hammering with rocks from riverbeds, and he has a broad-bladed spear made for him on a shorter stick for close-range executions. If swung hard enough, the weapon could cut through a man, apparently, according to legends, and with a rip and a pull, it would make the sound of ikhtwa when torn back out of the flesh of an opponent. And that's how the ikhtwa got its name, this weapon that Chaka Zulu and those after him would use. In 18, 1810 or 1811, when he's 23, Shaka's regiment is put under an experienced commander named Biza. Dingus Wayo had become familiar with European warfare tactics around this time, wanted to try and put their ideas into practice. Still, however, Dingus Wayo's uh, goal is to intimidate opposing forces, not to uh, kill many of them. He doesn't want to extermin exterminate them outright. Uh, he reminds his commanders that the goal is not to kill everyone, but Shaka doesn't listen. Regardless of his chief's wishes, he begins to fight to the death. And Dingus Wayo must not have been too upset about this because he promotes him to commander. And he starts to gain some notoriety. Fellow warriors soon call him Dingus Wayo's hero. He is the great stabber, his comrades say. They also gave him a, a new nickname, the axe that surpasses all other axes. This is the fucking best nickname he's had so far. This is way better than intestinal beetle heaven. It's a lot better than micropene flea pelt, which no one called him. Uh, Shaka star is rising. He becomes uh, legendary then when he battles the ogre Alembe. Mm -hmm. We're going to get into an ogre battle now. This ogre was apparently an angry giant who had troubled the Tetwa for many years. And this story has a lot of similarities to the tale of David and Goliath. It for sure did not actually happen. No way, it's crazy, but it's a good uh, you know, legend-building tale, good piece of folklore. I imagine Zulu elders telling it to awestruck Zulu children around campfires for many generations. According to this legend, a giant had been raiding cattle and pillaging area homesteads before retreating to its mountain fortress in the Lamambo mountain range. And randomly, I love this, this giant is a huge stoner. Not kidding. Did I mention that South Africans loved weed? Yep. Uh, when the Dutch showed up uh, to set up Cape Town back in 1652, the local Khoisan and Bantu peoples were very familiar with Mary Jane. Uh, the Dutch assumed some early Indian or Arab people had introduced it into the region long before or introduced it to others north of South Africa who then brought it down. No one knows for sure. Early South Africans smoked weed to ease the pains of childbirth or they would, you know, uh, chew on it. Uh, sometimes they would do that to, you know, get, take the edge off sometimes to get high as fuck. Then the Dutch got a hold of it. They started brewing it into teas. They also started baking it into foods so, you know, they could take the edge off, get high as fuck. The early edibles. Dutch doing some edible uh, eating a long time ago. We got to do a weed-centric suck one of these days. You know, learn a lot about weed. Who, who were the first to smoke it? The first to eat it? Anyway, oral traditions say this ogre loved his weed. He was a red-eyed giant, but not so chill. He was a wake and baker who single-handedly crushed whole regiments. He also commanded his own army that helped him in raids. And this ogre supposedly also had magical powers that never really are described in specific detail. Maybe he had the power to fight really well while stoned. That seems kind of magical. Uh, weed does not make me want to fight at all. Uh, chills me out. Anyway, according to legend, Shaka is assigned to confront Alam Alambe, the ogre, and his men. And he brings four companies of warriors to fight. After complicated maneuvers against the mythical monster and his men, Alam Alambe, and Shaka end up in a one-on-one -on -one showdown on the battlefield, just like they would in some old kung fu movie or in some period piece action blockbuster like the 300. The battle between these two legends goes back and forth until Shaka finally thrusts his spear into the giant's body with a killing blow. And then Nagadla, the giant, cries out, I have eaten, which is a random thing to say, I know. But that's what the old stories say that warriors cried out when they were defeated. I have eaten. Shaka then disembowels the corpse so that spirits of death will leave the spirit... Uh, will leave to the spirit world and will not stick around and haunt him. Thank God. I was, I was hoping he's going to do that. You got to get those guts out. Got to get those guts out unless you want to be haunted. Anyone who's battled a giant knows that. Anyone who's ever battled a magic stoner ogre knows that. Uh, the giant's forces then try to flee but are cut down by Shaka's men. It's incredibly bloody. Impressed by Shaka's victory over the ogre, many of the Tetwa warriors dip their spears in the giant's blood to ensure that some of the strength of the fallen monster will now be theirs. 
Back at home, Nandi, heroes of Shaka's accomplishments, as one would. Fucking, you kill a giant, word's gonna get around. She's very proud of her son. Uh, more battles come and end with similar results. Uh, more actual battles. As Dingan Wyo's army continues to conquer, they end up in Zulu territory after a while. Right, the land of, of Shaka's father. Uh, the Zulu's still a small tribe. Shaka's father sends on Gakona, still around, still running shit. He quickly agrees to pay tribute to his new lord, fearing that a confrontation with the fearsome army of Dingan's Wyo will mean his tribe's in- extinction. Here, Dingan's Wyo uh, sees an opportunity to create a more prominent role for his young rising military star and have a warrior loyal to him rule the Zulu underneath his crown. Dingus Wyo knows that Senzan Gankona is no military leader and that his sons, the Zulu princesses, uh, princes, uh, nothing more than pampered weaklings. If he puts Shaka in charge of the Zulus, Dingus Wyo feels he can use Shaka's allegiance to rally the tribes of central Zululand against a growing menace. The uh, Netwande tribe that we mentioned before that threatened the Tetwa from the north. Uh, so Diz, uh, Dingus Wyo devises an elaborate plan to ensure that Shaka will become the ruler of the Zulus in place of his father. Dingus Wyo is familiar with the complicated and downright shitty relationship between father and son here. He decides to capitalize on that. Dingus Wyo wants to rub Shaka's accomplishments in his father's face, so he invites his father to his court. And since the Zulu chief is now a subordinate, uh, he wants to make a good impression on his first visit, traveling with his sons, counselors, courtiers, uh, all of them clad in their best diplomatic attire. They head to the court. When they arrive, Tetua, uh, you know, the Tetua mount a dancing display. The Zulus dance first. Then the hosts, part of this, you know, tradition, ritual. During this dancing, Shaka appears with his huge war shield. He wears many wooden amulets and charms, signifying that he had killed many, many in battle. He also wears a magnificent kilt of meerkat, civet, mongoose tails, showing his prowess as a hunter. And of course, the monkey ear flaps. You know, can't forget the monkey skin ear flaps. Don't want to look like some kind of silly asshole showing up without those. Everyone in attendance admires Shaka's display of athleticism and all his, you know, regalia. His dad is impressed by this warrior in front of him, but he also doesn't recognize this warrior as his son. Pulling Shaka aside in private after the dance that evening, Dingus Wyo gives him the following instructions. Go immediately. Take these medicines. Wash yourself with them on the paths Senzan Gakona will take to in the river to bathe after the exertions of the dance. They will affect your father so that he can open his eyes and recognize his son. Go now. Dingus Wyo's servants direct the Zulu leader to a place downstream where they have doctored the uh, area with powerful concoctions. This is part of the you know myth-making, obviously. As we know, bathing upstream from a leader considered a sign of disrespect. So Shaka's peers flee. Shaka stands his ground. He stands naked and proud in his father's presence. And for the first time, Senzan Gakona realizes the impressive young warrior who danced so well was his son, the son he had tried to kill three times. Awkward. What do you say in a situation like that? Hello, son. Ha ha, how, how are things? How, how's, your, how's your mom? Uh, you look you look well. Hey, uh, I'm sorry about it. You know, abandoning you and trying to kill you all this time. <laughs> P- parenting, am I right? <laughs> so so challenging. You'll understand someday. I'm, I'm going to take off. Uh, that evening, Senzan Gakona and his sons are shown into Dingan's Wyo's hut. There, the Tetwa poison him. A poison that'll take a long time to kill him, which is kind of weird. The old seldom used, very slow poison poisoning. Then in accordance with tradition, each of Sendaga Kona's sons and favorite warriors are introduced as the rest of the group shouts praise. Each of Ding, uh, Dingus Wyo's, you know, uh, introduced the same way. Several of the most noted Detwa warriors enter, ranked from the least to the greatest. As singers roar praises of each, Shock enters last. He's the, he's the most highest regardless warrior, dressed in full battle regalia. Singers shout his praises. The one whose fame spreads even as he sits, the axe that surpasses all of their axes. Dingus Wyo asked the Zulu chief, Oh, does the chief then see the beast from the place of his people? Do you see your calf here? More cow talk. I see the beast, Shaka's father replies. Then why did you drive him from your home? Shaka's father has no answer. It's just very tense right now. Dingus Wyo continues, He is your son by the Elongani. He is a great warrior who killed Elambe, the madman, the giant in open combat, and he has a request to make of you. Shaka then approaches his father. I ask for one of your spears, Shaka says, knowing that Senzanga Kona had brought many with him. After an uncomfortable pause, some uneasy shuffling by his sons, Senzanga Kona says, choose one. Shaka then chooses the best of the spears, knowing it was the one assigned to his father's chosen heir. But that is for Senzanga son of my great wife, his father says. Shaka frowns, picks up the weapon anyway. He walks over to his half-brothers, and then in a sign of dominance, I love this, 
He just walks down the line of them and he just fucking bops them on their heads. Bop, bop, bop. Standing in front of Sanguana at the end, he says, greetings, my brother. And then he plunges the spear into the floor of the hut and he storms out. Shaka's brothers are frozen in awe. Their father was, you know, poisoned. He's not feeling so great. He says nothing. Later that night, as a final act of harassment, Shaka sneaks up onto the roof of Senzan Gokona's hut and he spills a foul-smelling concoction on the roof, which dribbles through the thatch onto his sleeping father. Noise! Classic abandoned son vengeance move. Pour some stink juice on dad. Climb up onto the roof of a poisoned father's hut and you spill rancid liquid. That'll make him smell like shit. That'll teach him for trying to kill you three times. Uh, before the Zulu party leaves to return home, Din, uh, Dingiz Wayo's, uh, D- Jesus, Dingiz Wayo tries to persuade them to take Shaka back as a new chosen heir, but his father refuses. Uh, a little more uneasily, but he refuses. Now he knows he has to watch his back. Uh, he has no idea his rejection will not matter. He's a walking dead man because of the poison. In 1816, Zenzan Gakona would never fully recover from the poison, dies after a lingering illness. Then Dingiz Wayo has the heir to the Zulu throne assassinated, that uh, brother that the spear was thrown down in front of, and he puts Shaka in power. Shaka returns home at long last to claim the Zulu throne, prepared to fight anyone that challenges him to the death. No one challenges him. Shaka quickly takes control of his father's homestead, settles down to rule the Zulu nation, which is now between 1,500 and 2,000 people. When he takes over, the Zulu's amongst the smallest of hundreds of tribes in Southern Africa. Shaka wastes no time in asserting his authority. He begins by settling some old scores, killing some bullies that fucked with him in his youth. Right? Who has their hands in the old shithole now, assholes? He removes anyone he thinks might pose a problem before assembling a few trusted advisors. Even though the Zulus have all treated him badly, he knows he has to cooperate with some of them. I must honor the ancients of my lineage, he tells his advisors. For am I not he whose will is iron? Have I not lived the head of an uh, Asagai? I shall raise, or have I not lived by the head of an Asagai, that spear? I shall raise this nation to greatness, as Manda Malandela predicted. Every time I see that name, I want to say uh, Mandela. Uh, Are you with me? And they cheer. As the new head of the Zulu people, Shaka then begins to take over nearby clans and gain more soldiers. Meanwhile, things not going great for his old tribe, the Tetwa. The Tetwa had attempted to invade Netawande territory, and his old mentor and king, Dingizwayo, is captured and killed by their ruler, Zwide. Zwide assumes uh, that Dingizwayo's confederation will now break apart after his rival's death, and that he can gobble up its constituent clans one at a time through a combination of treachery, intimidation, and military conquest. With Dingus Wayo out of the way, Zwide is the most powerful military and political ruler in the entire region, but Shaka Zulu doesn't give a fuck. He's not letting the man who killed the man who'd made him king take him down. He takes control of more surrounding tribes, such raising a bigger army to rival Zwide's. He knows if he doesn't kill Zwide and his people, Zwide will sniff out, or snuff, sniff out, snuff out the Zulu nation. Very different, you know, word there. I'd be weird if I just kept going. He's going to sniff them out. He's going to, you know, find out where they are, maybe smell them. He's going to keep on going. Uh, Shaka works to increase his 400-man army into a 4,500-man army, roughly. Sources say between 4,000 and 4,500 in just a year. Uh, the rivalry between Shaka and Zwide becomes a major part of the first stages of a tumultuous era in the region known as the Mepakane, uh, the times of trouble, the struggle between uh, sh- the struggle between Shaka and Zwide for supremacy, God, for supremacy, encompasses not only military matters, but economic and agricultural matters as well. Cattle still the currency of the day. Shaka leads his ra- raiders to get as many cattle, as much of the best grazing land as possible. Uh, and then they also, of course, go to war. Shaka revolutionizes war here uh, to defeat his rifle. Let's talk about how he does this. Shaka's method of hand-to-hand combat had now replaced spear throwing as a dominant fighting style. Now everyone in Shaka's army accepts that there is no mercy for a defeated opponent. We're not throwing some spears and letting them go. We're killing them. Shaka also starts recruiting teenage boys to carry warrior supplies, freeing the warriors to move faster from battle to battle, have more energy when they get there. Uh, he changes the tribe's marital customs to make his warriors tougher. He makes it so that young men are not allowed to get married until they have proven themselves in battle. You know, obviously it makes them fight harder. Uh, numbers of young women in the kingdom are assembled into uh, these kind of middle military settlements where they will wait to be warriors' wives. Officially, until then, they are wards of the king. Uh, sexual intercourse between members of male and female, uh, you know, unmarried people, forbidden. Uh, transgressions punished by death. No word on whether or not the uh, thigh gap fucking continued. Uh, he also has his soldiers go barefoot so that their feet will become calloused and rough, making them more agile and quicker in battle. He wants his entire army to be able to run between 30 and 50 miles in a day and then fight a battle at the end. I'm, uh, man, 
I would make it. Uh, he even has them dance on devil thorns to toughen their feet up. These are these super spiky little burrs. Uh, these little weeds, they look terrible. Look like they would cut your feet to ribbons. According to legend, he executes any soldier that winces while they dance on these razor sharp little spiky balls. Uh, dancing is incorporated into his military tactics as well. It's debated whether or not Shaka introduced this. Uh, whether he did or not, it would expand the Zulu empire. Like marching, in modern boot camps, Zulu regiments use collective dancing and chanting at festivals to practice unified action. Group dancing and chanting also creates a bond between soldiers, and uh, it, it can be used as psychological intimidation. He would have thousands of soldiers stamp their feet in unison to make the ground literally shake, creating an effect, you know, it makes it sound like it's a gigantic monster, you know, uh, coming to destroy villages. He, has, he also has his warriors sing call and response chants. He has them rattle their spears against their shields. I guess it made it sound like rolling thunder. Uh, and in deploying his army, Shaka would have his regiment sit with their shields edge to edge to the enemy, concealing their numbers from a distance. Uh, at Shaka's command, the soldiers could stand up, flash their shields forward, suddenly revealing their true numbers and strength. Deception like this was new to the South African battlefield. Uh, maybe most importantly, he develops this new battle formation called the Beast's Horns. These formations, usually five ranks deep, each file occupying about four feet of uh, front. He imagined, his uh, he imagined his deployed army as a gigantic buffalo. The center section was called the chest. This was uh, backed up by the loins, who acted as a reserve to both support the chest and deliver the killing blow when the enemy was about to break. They would uh, rest and wait early in the battle, sometimes have their backs turned to the fighting so they wouldn't be tempted to rush in. And then when called, these fresh soldiers, the loins, would rush in and attack the enemy. Uh, on either side of this form these formations were the horns, each composed of one regiment, while the enemy's main force was absorbed in its battle with the chest, the horns would swing around uh, both wings and behind, completely encircling him. By the time they realized they were surrounded, the enemy would start to panic. When they would try to escape, the, the real slaughter would begin. Uh, at this point, the toes would be quickly sent in. The toes were, uh, you know, uh, two groups of five pairs of warriors that tried to stay close to each other but not touch. Sometimes one group would kind of lay on top of the other slightly smaller group. Uh, then there was the dreaded taint. The taint would hide between the ass and the balls, and they often weren't even seen in battle, but you could sense they were near. You could usually smell them, and that's, that's nonsense. No, the chest, loins, and horns were the real formations. These formations would continue to be used long after Shaka's death. Over the years, Shaka used his new tactic to defeat many other chiefs, enlarging his territory, uh, enlarging the territory of the Zulus. He also became increasingly brutal, and some say he would eventually become mad. According to legend, Shaka had his warriors clubbed to death if they showed the slightest sign of weakness in battle. Any hesitation, they would be clubbed to death. He would kill his own warriors if they uh, ended up with wounds on their backs because he would assume they were cowards who would run from an attack. And he also randomly uh, started killing his shortest men, <laughs> assuming they wouldn't be able to see the enemy approaching. And I don't know why that's funny to me. Michael, I see you have a slash on your back. Death to this coward! PD hugs and stuff. Get over here. You are, I don't know, too short for my liking. Death to the little fella. Uh, Shaka names its capital silly, silly, capital city, Bulawayo, which apparently meant the place where they are killed, which if true is psychotic. Welcome to my city, the place where they are killed. Don't worry about where you're going to stay, what you can eat. Not going to be staying or eating for long. You're going to be killed. That's what happens here. It's the worst city ever. Uh, here he condemns anyone he remembers from childhood who he hadn't already killed, who had treated him badly to brutal deaths. Uh, Shaka, as he's getting into this, you know, uh, fighting more and more and expanding his empire, he does this uh, strange, untraditional thing. He never takes a wife, never fathers any children, paranoid that an heir will plot against him. If one of his concubines becomes pregnant, he has her executed. He's a single-minded dictator uh, who will kill thousands for the sake of unifying the Zulu tribes. Uh, he didn't always destroy his opponents. He would also use patronage and reward rather than war and intimidation. Uh, chiefs of tribes who surrendered to him were made commanders in his own tribe. That's kind of similar to what a lot of ancient rulers did, like a Genghis Khan and stuff. Uh, the tr traditional leaders of chiefdoms he conquered would still hold uh, local administrative authority. Uh, once married, young men who fought for him would return to live in their community of origin. This helped unify the people of Zululand. Uh, from 1817 to 1818, Shaka finally fights his biggest rival, the Netawande, led by Zwide. We've been hearing about him for a while. This conflict called the Zulu Civil War will last over a year. In April of 1818, Shaka fights his first major battle against Zwide. In spite of being significantly outnumbered, he only had about 4,000 warriors to Zwide's total army of 12 to up to 25,000 in some sources. 
a masterful strategy and tactics will win the battle for Shaka. Shaka hears word of a planned invasion against him. He gets to work strategizing a defense. To delay the approaching Ntwande invasion, invading army under command of Zwide's eldest son and heir, uh, Nomen Lajana, Shaka posts forces along the fords of the White Umfalazi River to delay the enemy, while the river is still relatively high. Meanwhile, he lays waste to the area to, on the south uh, Zulu side of the river and moves most of his clan's non-combatants and cattle into hiding in the Nakandala forest on the southern extremities of Zululand. He then places the bulk of his troops around the top of a now famous Gokli Hill with the reserve and all his supplies out of sight in a depression on top of the hill. His army, again, about 4,000 warriors, uh, you know, seems even smaller than that to the invading army just because the way you could kind of like see it on top of the hill. Nomen Lanjana, seeing far fewer soldiers than he expected at the top of the hill, anticipates it's going to be a quick massacre. He says, like, butchering cattle. His portion of his army stands, uh, again, around 12, 25,000 men, eager to kill Shaka to please his father and to please his, his grandmother, his grandmother, Zwide's mother. Natambazi apparently kept a grizzly museum in her hut of all the heads of the chiefs that her son had killed. Proud mom, just keeping some heads in my hut. Oh, my son killed that guy. Look at that guy over there. See that guy, that head? The, no, the other head. Yeah, he killed that guy too. Uh, and uh, they they thought that, you know, um, they could add Shaka's head to this. I guess Diz, Dingiz Wayo, one of the most prized heads in this collection. Zwide intends to add, again, Shaka's skull to her collection. Shaka puts a plan together that relies mainly on four factors to tilt battle into his favor. Demonstrating his expert knowledge of military theory and insight about opponents' psychology. First, he understands that even though he's heavily outnumbered, he can give his army a huge advantage by perching higher than his opponent. Not only will the enemy tire itself out by climbing the big hill to fight him, but they won't be able to throw their spears uphill very effectively. The superior numbers of, the, of Netawande's uh, army will also work against them. As they close in on the circular formation of the Zulus at the top of the hill, they'll have to crowd into one another, hampering their room to fight effectively. So that's one factor. Uh, second is he relies on the rough, barren terrain of where he's fighting. The area around Gokli Hill is parched, stripped of any food. Stream beds are dry. Nearest water is a full mile away. He stocks his own men before the battle with plenty of water and food to last for many days of fighting. Loads these provisions, you know, hides them up on the hill. He's counting on the attacking Netawande's hot, thirsty, young, hungry men as they charge up the hill. As they exert themselves, they're going to get physically, psychologically weaker. And his rested, hydrated, energized men are going to be at full force. And then the third uh, little factor, Shaka knows his enemy can be greedy, and he devises a plan to draw off a significant chunk of Nomen Lanjana's army by tempting them with an irresistible lure. Before dawn, he has a regiment of older men and 200 of his youngest soldiers take a herd of cattle, we are not done with cow talk, to a mountain about seven miles south of Gokli and lead them away. He instructs the group to cause a loud commotion making it seem as though the entire Zulu herd and half of their army is retreating. He hopes that Nolim, Nomenlin Jana's men are going to be unable to resist such a prize and that part of the army will splinter off in pursuit of precious cattle. And they do. It works. Uh, Netawan, the Netawande general, thinking he was seeing the entire Zulu herd and half their army flee, sends about 4,000 men to chase these cattle down. And then the fourth factor, uh, this new fighting system, Chaka is confident in the discipline and training of his new army right, in that buffalo formation with their new weapons, their tough conditioning, their Spartan-like discipline. He knows they have a chance at victory. By about nine o'clock in the morning, on the first day of fighting, once all eight of the remaining Netwande regiments, probably around 8,000 men, but again, maybe as many as uh, 20,000 men, are arranged at the bottom of Gokli Hill, uh, no minute Lanjana gives them the signal for the attack. In the first charge up the slopes, it quickly becomes apparent that Netawande's superiority in numbers is a hindrance. Shaka Zulu is right. The soldiers crowd into each other, makes it difficult for them to throw their spears effectively, which I get. You know, these are big spears. They're bumping into people. It's throwing off the aim. When Shaka orders a counterattack, his men, who have no throwing spears, they have these short stabbing spears, the Iktwas, they charge downhill, and they slice up the charging forces. And then the uh, enemy retreats, and then they gather again. They come back up the hill. They retreat again. This keeps happening. As many as five attacks are made during the, that day all fail to overwhelm the small band of Zulus. Uh, just after the fourth attack has been repulsed, Shaka sees a smoke signal to the south. This means he has little time left to destroy Nomen Lanjana's main army before it's reinforced by the people coming back from chasing after that cattle. Uh, Nomen Lanjana calculates, based on the thinning ranks of the four Zulu regiments he can see on the hill, 
that he, he still has a vastly superior force. He really thinks he can still take them. He's not aware of their ability to refresh themselves on the top of the hill. And he also concludes that, uh, you know, these the Zulu warriors, they, they got to be getting as hot, tired, and thirsty as his own men. So he decides to make one last decisive attack. He moves 1,500 of his warriors to the north of the hill in a gigantic attack column, about 20 men wide, 75 ranks deep. Shaka can see very well what's coming. He feels the time is ripe for him to spring a trap. Time to send in the taint! No. He keeps his elite brigade out of sight, fresh in the hilltop depression. The loins, now he unleashes them. They hadn't fought yet. They're 100% rested, hydrated, fully fed. And as the Netawande shock column charges up the hill, Shaka launches his reserves into two encircling wings, completely enveloping the Netawande column. The loins used as the horns. They hadn't expected such a large force to come out of nowhere. They start to panic, fighting uh, off a much larger force. And this is the second day now. So I didn't mention that. This is after two hot days. Shaka and his men inflict four times as many casualties as the enemy. The Zulu had an estimated 2,000 casualties. Netawande incurred around 7,500. The battle is the first major field test of Shaka's new army and his system of combat, and it passes with flying colors. Everything has gone well for the Zulus. Their discipline, training, weapons, tactics, logistics, and strategic position. But this was only one battle in a greater war. While Shaka's new tactics, his newly trained army, his shrewd battle plan saved his people from extermination, he had by no means eliminated the Netwande threat. He knew Zwide would soon be back with an even larger army, maybe smarter generals. Shaka had to rebuild his forces. In May of 1819, Shaka and King Zwide's second major battle takes place, the Battle of Mlatuze River. The Zulu army had now grown to around 10,000 warriors through Shaka's vigorous diplomacy with other tribes. He aimed to recruit angry warriors with scores to settle with Zwide and attracted thousands of such men. Zwide reinvaded with 18,000 under his best general yet, Shoshangani. Uh, by this time, the Netawande had adopted Zulu battle tactics and weapons, so Shaka's new techniques would not hold the same advantage. Shaka now wore the invaders down with guerrilla tactics before launching a major attack. When the Netawande army was divided as it crossed the Mlatuze River, after he wins this battle, Shaka uses another psychological tactic and sends Zule, Zulu warriors to Zwide's headquarters near present-day Nangoma before messengers had brought news of Zwide's defeat. This is a little s- sneaky stuff here. As the uh, Zulu warriors approach the camp, they pretend to be Netawande warriors. They sing Netawande victory songs to get close to the village, have all the villagers you know, come out of their hiding places and come to you know, uh, embrace their warriors, and then they get fucking slaughtered. They slaughter all the men of fighting age. They capture many of the rest. Uh, Zwide ends up getting killed. Most of the Netawande abandon their lands, migrate north, and uh, establish Zulu-like kingdoms in Zambia, Malawi, Mozambique, Tanzania. Zwide's bloodthirsty mother ends up getting executed by Shaka in a particularly ghastly way by uh, getting locked in her own skull museum with the ravenous hyena that eats her alive. Yikes. Uh, Shoshengane, one of Zwide's generals, flees to Mozambique with many of the Netawande and established the Gaza Kingdom. Meanwhile, Shaka's power of military might continues to grow. By 1823, Shaka controls all the present-day Natal. The Zulu conquests greatly destabilize the region, result in a great wave of migrations by uprooted tribes. Around 1824, Shaka comes across his first white, his, comes across his first white adventurers. While white colonizers would play a massive role in the history of South Africa, they play almost no role in the story of King Shaka Zulu. They did, however, provide him medical care after Shaka survived one of his many assassination attempts. In order to receive the best treatment, he called for white settlers to come and treat him. As a sign of gratitude, he allowed them to settle in Port Natal, and that settlement becomes Durban, now the third most populous city in South Africa. In October of 1827, Shaka's mother, Nandi, dies, and he goes batshit fucking crazy. Micropene flea pelt loses his mind. Holy shit, does he lose it. This will be the beginning of the end now for Shaka. Becomes a mad king. In his grief, he forces his entire kingdom to mourn his mother in some pretty extreme ways. He issues an order that no new crops are to be planted for a year. He doesn't want anybody celebrating a harvest while they should be sad about his mom. And that plunges his people into famine. Uh, some wonder if he becomes, you know, mentally ill around this time too. He demands that no milk be used for a year. Right? He doesn't want you enjoying some milk when you should be focusing on being sad about his mom. Uh, he demands that all pregnant women and their husbands are killed. Don't become a mom and have that feel that joy. It's going to take the focus off the memory of my mom. Uh, even all cows that give birth are killed so that calves can know how it feels to lose a mother. Final act of cow drama here. Jesus. Uh, He also has around 7,000 people allegedly executed for not mourning his mother's death hard enough. 
Not enough tears for mother, and you die. Uh, also sends his army on an extensive military operation, and when they return exhausted, he immediately orders them out again uh, while he stays behind to do more grieving, just making a bunch of insane decisions. And this would be the last straw for uh, some of his Zulu chiefs. On September 22nd, 1821, some lesser chiefs, uh, the people had had enough of Shaka's cruelty. Shaka's half-brothers, Dingane and Malangana, Mlangana, they uh, realize that Shaka has gone mad. They have three assassins kill him when almost all of his warriors are away on yet another mass sweep to the north. According to legend, as the great king Shaka's life ebbs away, he calls out to his brother Dengane, who will take his throne, his half-brother. His last words are supposedly, brother, you kill me, thinking you will rule, but the swallows will do that. And by swallows, he means white people, because they made their houses of mud like swallows. Then he finished with, are you stabbing me, kings of the earth? You will come to an end through killing one another. And then he's buried in an unmarked grave made from an empty grain pit, which his brothers piled with stones in KwaZulu-Natal. He's 40, 41 years old, has no heirs. At the time of his death, Shaka ruled over roughly 250,000 people after starting with between 1,500 and 2,000 people a dozen years before. Then Ghani went on to rule for about uh, 12 years as well, at which point another half-brother, Mampande, with Boer and British support, takes over Zulu leadership and rules for 30 years, starting in 1840. Uh, in 1836, backing up a little bit, the earliest two eyewitness accounts uh, were written of, of Shaka were written by European adventure traders who met Shaka during the last four years of his reign, and those are published. Nathaniel Isaacs collaborated with Henry Francis Finn, and publishes Travels and Adventures in Eastern Africa, which portrays Shaka as a degenerate and a pathological monster, a feared, insane ruler. Uh, and then the last bit of our timeline here, 1955, uh, the most popular accounts of Shaka Zulu's life published much later in E.A. Ritter's 1955 novel, Shaka Zulu, a steamy romance, later edited into something closely resembling, resembling a history, but not quite. A number of later historians will go on to modify and critique these stories. And now let's get out of this timeline to look back at the legacy of Shaka Zulu. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Fascinating stuff, I think. I just, I just love how different this, uh, this suck was than many of the ones we've done, just learning about such a different place in the world where the customs and rituals are so different than, uh, you know, many of the European places we've, we've kind of explored before. Uh, Shaka Zulu was an inspiring, br brilliant military commander, as well as an expert politician who came from humble origins. You don't get to, you know, uh, pull that many different, like, tribal clans together without being a decent politician. He had a horrible childhood which may be explained why he became a sadistic and homicidal despot, uh, may also owe to the time and place he occupied where might made right. Strong did what they, you know, wanted. The weak had to suffer. Strong did what I guess they maybe they had to do to, to be uh, in charge. Shitty as his terrible childhood was, he also had the psychological benefit of knowing he was descended from a line of great Zulu kings. An impressive physical stature. All the stories say he was just a fucking big, strong dude. And a mom who never stopped telling him that he was destined for greatness. He revolutionized weaponry, military tactics, won countless battles. Uh, he also hated being tricked into, you know, grabbing shit. Maybe had a tiny penis. Uh, really loved his mom. Never sold RC dune buggies. About 10 years after his first major victory in battle, he was killed by his own people after losing his shit. Uh, and he was buried in an unmarked grave. Although stories of Shaka's brutality and insanity are well known today, it is unclear how much of these stories are true. So I should say that before we get out of here. There's just not much surviving evidence to confirm the accuracy of these stories, you know, in, in any kind of direction. Stories surrounding his birth, childhood, legends, you know, like the ones about the, like the one about the ogre. I mean, certainly exaggerated, if not made up entirely. Uh, as the sources for Shaka's life derive from either variable Zulu story, storytellers or biased white chroniclers of the colonial era, may be possible that his brutality was exaggerated. Uh, maybe some kind of rational explanation for his insanity. We just don't know. So much maybe just lost to history. Uh, despite what has been lost, uh, to have so many stories told about him, to be talked about so much as a historical figure, I think that proves that he was one of the most noteworthy warriors and rulers of black South African history. Now let's look at him a little bit more before we get out of here with today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Shaka Zulu had a terrible childhood, starting with being literally named intestinal beetle heaven. After his mother became pregnant out of wedlock, he's forced to... Uh, out of both of his mother and father's tribes, made to live on the edges of society, called names, beat up, taunted, forced to lick burning spoons, grab piles of human shit. If this is all true, 
if even half of it is true, what an interesting, almost Shakespearean story. A kid comes out of a tiny tribe. It's part of a prophecy to change the face of the entire region. Number two, while Shaka expanded the Zulu nation, expansion efforts really began with Dingiz Wayo, the Tetwa chief who took Shaka under his wing. Under Dingiz Wayo, the Tetwa rose to prominence, mostly employing diplomacy and assimilation of nearby chiefdoms to strengthen their power base. Under him, Shaka learns how to build his own Zulu empire. Number three, Shaka reinvents South African warfare with brutal and clever tactics. Using a combination of psychological warfare, expert fighting tactics, advanced weaponry, knowledge of geography, retiring that weird game of throwing spears at an enemy a long ways away until they just decide to say fuck it and go home, Shaka's army had victory after victory. Number four, Shaka was probably cool as fuck. Uh, if legends are true, when his mom died, perhaps roughly 7,000 people murdered for what he considered uh, to be not mourning her death strongly enough. He prevented the rest of his people from eating food they'd grown. He killed women for getting pregnant. Many other horrible atrocities may have killed his own soldiers. Uh, even before that, for just, uh, you know, being too short. Number five, something new. Along with oral traditions, Zulu beadwork also tells elaborate stories about their culture. Every color and shape of bead has its own intricate cultural meaning. All colors except white, which only represents love and purity, have both positive and negative meanings dependent on what bead is stitched alongside it color of the beadwork one chooses to wear can even symbolize mood with black indicating one is mourning green depicting contentment or bliss in marriage traditionally zulu men would rely on these messages for certain information like whether or not a woman was married beadwork told others how many children the wearer had what region she he hailed from how many unmarried sisters she he had Zulu storytelling uh, has also, also made its way into American culture in a way you might be surprised to find out. The song known to the world as The Lion Sleeps Tonight has deep roots in Zulu musician Solomon Linda's song, Mubebe, uh, written in the 1920s. Mubebe is a Zulu word meaning lion. The song Mubebe made uh, Solomon Linda a star in South Africa, selling over 100,000 copies by 1949. Here is some of the original version of the song that would end up becoming The Lion Sleeps Tonight. Yeah! You recognize the melody here in a little bit. This is 1939 recording. You can just hear the, the heart of it. Now, Mube, uh, Mubebe's melody, influenced by traditional Zulu choral music, uh, went on a whirlwind transformative journey before ending up in a, an American animated film. It was discovered during the early 1950s, this song, by American musicologist Alan Lomax, who then gave the song to his friend, folk musician Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger and the Weavers. Ze Seeger retitles it, you know, Weem Away, a Weem Away, a Weem Away, you know, an approximate phonetic rendering of the song's Zulu language refrain, uh, Uyimbu, ah man, Uyimbube, You Are a Lion, and it's introduced to America by the Weavers. Uh, they record a studio version in 1952, becomes a top 20 hit in the U.S. Then the Weavers version inspires a 1961 version recorded by the Tokens. Uh, new lyrics are written by George David Weiss. It's retitled The Lion Sleeps Tonight. It ends up in Disney's 1994 The Lion King. Then the fa family, the descendants of Solomon Linda, sue Disney. Uh, damn you, Roy Disney! How could you? First you kill your mom, now this. Uh, no, Disney was settled for an undisclosed amount of money in 2006. And, uh, and Roy Disney never killed his mom. Uh, in case any Disney lawyers uh, are listening. And that's all for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. I'm going to play this in the, in the background. It's quiet. Uh, I, I really like it. Uh, Shaka Zulu has been sucked. Really hoping I spend less time on pronunciation videos next week. Hope I didn't butcher too much of it. Um, grateful that Shaka had the easiest name out of basically every character in today's suck. Really interesting stories. Uh, I liked them. I hope you did too. Thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help in making Time Suck. Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley. Script Keeper, Zach Flannery. Sophie Fact, Sorceress Evans, Bit Elixir. Logan Keith. The Art Warlock running BadMagicMerch.com and the socials. Thanks to all of those who have joined the Cult of the Curious private Facebook group. Over 25,000 members. An ever-growing list of subgroups. 
Uh, thanks to Liz Hernandez and her all-seeing eyes running the Cult of the Curious Facebook page. Thanks to the wonderful weirdos having fun in Discord as well. Thanks to all you space scissors playing Time Suck Trivia on the app. Congrats to uh, Chef TJ323, a.k.a. TJ Natilla, Round 6 winner with 6,277 points. Your Cowboy Pigeon Trophy and Victory Certificate in the mail. You should have already been emailed your merch store credit. Round 7 has started. Next week on Time Suck Operation Paperclip. To World War II, the American government had a choice. Let Nazi scientists be dealt with in Europe where they might fall into Soviet hands or bring them to the U.S. where they could work to win the arms race and space race for the Americans. They went with the second option. Operation Paperclip was born, uh, bringing with, uh, beginning with the Alsace mission in May of 1944. Under Operation Paperclip, 1,600 of the Nazis' best and brightest brought over to America with help from some documents, doctoring, and records erasing to make it look like they did not have the very, very shady past that they did have. Past that involved working at forced labor factories, past that involved torturing laborers, past that involved experimenting on humans, concentration camp shit. But they had info, valuable, hard to attain information, and the U.S. wanted it. And in exchange for it, the Nazis never prosecuted, with the exception of one. Uh, and they and they got to live lives in the U.S. working on projects where they were, you know, experts. Some of them even became illustrious superstars in the world of rocket science and other tech before retrieving and or retiring, excuse me, in lavish comfort, superstars who had once been Nazis. Next week also, uh, we will get into some of the very shady things the U.S. military had, uh, has done as far as testing on civilians, civilians of other countries before and after Operation Paperclip was in effect. It wasn't just Nazis doing these things. Scientific progress often, unfortunately, doesn't just happen without some level of unethical behavior, or at least it didn't used to happen. Even testing on animals, you know, is unethical according to many. Bojangles is furious. I didn't say unethical according to all. But we do have so much knowledge today that comes from past meat sack sufferings. As the saying goes, you can't make an omelet without cracking a few eggs. But does that make it right? Should those omelet chefs maybe uh, not have been Nazis? All that and more next week on Time Suck. And now today's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. Uh, first up, very cool Navajo Code Talkers related update coming in from an anonymous military sucker who writes, Greeting Suckmaster from a loyal longtime space lizard linguist. And the little asterisk. Very happy to finally see the Navajo Code Talkers get their own suck episode, especially tandem to the Enigma Machine episode. Up to this point, all I had to go on were the movies U571 and that Nick Cage joint called Wind Talkers, both of which are mainly entertainment rather than historical accounts. So if we all chipped in a little extra this month, could we hire Nicolas Cage to record an episode of Time Suck and just not tell the other meat sacks? I'm sure he needs the money. I fucking love that. Uh, my military adjacent job title is language analyst, which is the reason I'm writing you this email. I really wanted to make the distinction clear and give due credit to the thousands of men and women who previously and currently do this job across all branches of the military. There's a clear distinction between a linguist and a language analyst. Uh, linguists study the science and culture of a given language and are most often going to be located at a university, college, or institute. It may be a little bit of a generalization, but consider linguists to be actively pursuing the study of language for the sake of education, sociology, science, psychology, arts, and so forth. You will not find linguists where I work, though for the sake of ease, we will call ourselves. We all call ourselves linguists. Conversely, language analysts are concerned with obtaining fluency that directly correlates to producing or interpreting valuable intelligence information, much like how the Navajo Code Talkers were concerned with safeguarding such information. They are not just trained in global language skills. Analysts are also extensively trained in cryptology. A talented linguist does not commonly possess the skills required to perform as a language analyst and vice versa. Many language analysts do not have enough global linguistic skills to talk their way through buying top shelf saffron in a seedy back alley Middle Eastern market, which I have done before. I know when it's authentic saffron versus when it's Kroll's cafe quality. The most recent example of my memory would be the analysts that worked in Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, doing everything in their power to prevent coalition forces from losing their lives to the Taliban. Putting aside how quickly America forgot about that war, it's notable to me that Americans don't know the difference between these two titles, linguist versus analyst, but that's fine. We are few and far between, and I've never been the kind to ever crave the attention of the thank you for your service crowd anyways. Plus, our work is normally highly classified, which is why I had to scan this email a hundred times to make sure I wasn't saying something that Sarsaparilla at the front office wouldn't clear. Your loyal space lizard name redacted. P.S. The language training we go through is intense, to say the least. For instance, if you're learning 
uh, Pashto, you have one year to get fluent. That means day one, you know nothing. Day 365-ish, you are fluent at a high school level. When you count homework, most students are working about 44 to 50 hours a week, just grinding through their language until the end test. It's a high stress environment, mainly because learning the language rewires your brain. So doing it at an accelerated rate can make you a bit loopy, i.e. nightmares in the language for the first few months. Uh, Example link to a military career in this field, just in case you thought that this kind of work wasn't a modern job. Uh, Well, very cool message. Anonymous crypto crypto logic language analyst uh, and the Air Force's website. Uh, I don't know why I was surprised by this. Uh, Top notch. Uh, just, I don't know, just very stylish, cool looking. Not sure I've ever looked at it before. Uh, looks awesome. I I love learning about jobs that I didn't really know about before or hadn't thought about. Uh, You have a very cool one. I'm definitely jealous of your language abilities. I'm still, still trying to get this English shit down. Uh, that's crazy about the nightmares in a new language. Uh, Enjoy that saffron and thanks for doing what you do. And thanks for sharing that info with us. Uh, next up another top shelf veteran sucker, Marine Paul Stroker, uh, inspired to write in by the code talker suck. Paul writes. Dan just finished the Navajo Code Talkers uh, episode. Let me by start. Let me start by saying thank you for recognizing those heroes, and also sorry for the loss of your grandpa Ward. Oh, thank you. Uh, I've been meaning to write after the Victor Fra- Frankel suck, and cemented that uh, I had to after today. How you describe the feeling of stepping from the landing craft onto Guadalcanal? I don't know that exact feeling, but I've been close. I joined the Marine Corps at 19, uh, but had never had never been on a plane until the flight to boot camp. Graduated boot camp. Marine combat training, an MOS school, military occupational specialty, to be a combat engineer. Two weeks later, was on a plane to Kuwait to acclimate for Iraq. Well, I happened to join January of 2004. So I got to Iraq right as the heavy fighting was about to begin. Our AO area of operations was the Al Ambar province. So I got to experience Fallujah, Ramadi, Haditha, etc. All in the fall 2004, spring 2005 timeframe. When it was at peak uh, from Operation Phantom Fury to the first elections in Iraq. My job was route clearance. So we were the poor bastards who got to play with landmines, find IEDs, all while getting shot at. Needless to say, I experienced quite a bit of adrenaline before my 20th birthday. Apparently, you know the feeling better than you think you do as the way you described it is accurate. I did another trip back to Iraq in 2007, 2008. Damn, uh, that was a little calmer. But after getting out, I searched for anything for that same high. Motorcycles, fast cars, bar fights, etc. Had ridiculous PTSD that I always downplayed because of the therapy that finding the same rush provided. After a few motorcycle wrecks over the years, I had to hang it up, which made things worse. Also struggled finding a purpose and a meaning for my life outside of the military. That's where you and the Frankel Suck stepped in, you beautiful bastard. I've been in therapy since October for my PTSD, and listening to the Frankel Suck gave me new hope and renewed purpose to help friends and fellow vets in the same predicament I was. My days honestly have been a lot brighter since. Now looking for uh now looking for and being focused on the silver lining. So for that, thank you. Keep keep on sucking. Semper Fi and happy new year. P.S. If stand-up comedy comes back into fashion and we get to meet in person, the first round is on me. Oh, that's very nice. Paul, thank you for the drink offer. And you warm my heart with that message. I love that you are, you know, taking what you're learning and helping others. Thank you for your sacrifice as well. Holy shit, man. You live through stuff. I've only watched in uh, documentaries and on in movies. I'm so glad you're finding meaning in this next phase of your life and that, you know, you can just, uh, in that meaning, you know, use so much of the, of the pride and the accomplishments you have from the previous phase in your life to, to help others, the contributions you made, the experience you had, you know, never really die. And now you're passing along your knowledge to others. Uh, hope your days continue to be brighter uh, as, you know, as, as much as is reasonable to be brighter. Uh, I know for no one. You're not going to generally have, you know, nothing but bright days. I'm living proof you don't need PTSD to be moody. Uh, I have the old brain rain clouds floating from time to time, no matter what I do. Luckily, they always seem to float on out after a bit. So I hope you have a a good amount of happy days and you just push on through the the cloudy ones. Hail Nimrod, brother. And now Super Sucker Cheyenne has some thoughts on the Victor Frankel suck as well. Uh, Some of what she's referring to is from a recent secret suck where the script keeper and Reverend Doctor and I all discussed Frankel's philosophy a bit more in depth. I don't think you need to be familiar with that episode or that discussion to understand this update, though. And I wanted to share it. She writes, hey, Bad Magic crew, listening to the latest behind the suck and very interested in the conversation about Victor Frankel. I wasn't going to say anything about Dan's bit on trauma and victim mentalities, but after everyone agreed that medical illness and free will are different things, I had to point something out. People with mental illness are not necessarily able to control or choose the way they think. Trauma, even and especially childhood trauma, physically alters the brain. I agree that a victim mentality isn't helpful, but I think it's important to recognize that choosing a different path or getting back on track is not necessarily a possibility for everyone. 
What's most important is a survivor, or sorry, what's more important is a survivor mentality that gives people control and agency. Teaching people to heal or take control of their life by acknowledging there are legitimate challenges or barriers for them, but persisting anyway. I love that but persisting anyway. I know you're not minimizing mental illness, but I think it's an important thing to clarify. Thanks for all you do. Shout out to the Cult of the Curious Mental Health page. We're starting monthly meditations if anyone wants to check them out. Very cool. Thank you, Cheyenne. Uh, Almost 500 space lizards inside this mental health group right now. Uh, If you want to find it, open Facebook, and in the Facebook search bar, type Cult of the Curious Mental Health. One of the many subgroups that will pop up. Keep popping up. New ones. Excuse me. I, I love it so much. Uh, the community branch now, building new communities. Uh, and you make a great point. Yeah, when I talk about not wanting people to fall into the trappings of a victim mentality, definitely not trying to minimize having been victimized, which I, which I know I don't think you're saying. Uh, yet trauma, yes, yeah, some trauma is so severe, it does alter the way one thinks. One can be able to think. It can leave someone physically disabled as well with obvious limits as far as what they can accomplish in certain aspects. I, I like that term survivor mentality. I like how uh, you wrote, but persisting anyway, despite legitimate challenges or, or barriers. I think that term is very empowering, more empowering. Uh, and that's what I want, to help empower people, uh, to help them achieve more success, find more happiness, find more meaning, push to accomplish whatever they can within their own individual trappings, trappings we all have in some way, shape, or form, and then live the most rewarding life possible for them in that, uh, in that whatever their box is. So enjoy those meditations and thank you for, for, the, for the message. A very powerful and touching message now coming from Super Sack Vanessa Walker. Vanessa writes, Hail Nimrod and praise Bojangles. I was so excited to listen to the Victor Frankl suck last week. Heard about man's search for meaning on the show sometime back. I bought a copy at some point early in the pandemic, thinking I'd read it with some of my spare time. In a past life, before July, I taught in a school for kids with various learning differences and social emotional needs. What made it awesome is that it was one to one. So I got to have great relationships with my kids, students. It was like being a teacher, mentor, and sometimes a family member to kids who needed a little extra attention. In fact, I learned about the suck from one of these kids. Hey, Troy. Uh, My favorite kiddo was a kid named Henry. He was Jewish. He suffered from severe depression. He was the smartest kid I ever had the pleasure of teaching. We could spend an hour talking about the complexities of the Cold War, Judaism's influence on Catholicism, and complex social issues. I played him a few snippets of the suck, especially the one about bizarre mental conditions, and he would have made a great time sucker. I say everything in the past tense because he died by suicide last May. That loss is painful beyond anything I have ever felt. I can imagine it's how it feels to lose a child of my own. Since then, I've kept in touch with his family, and we've learned to move forward with our grief. Okay, so on to the book. I stand yeah, sorry for your loss. That is, yeah, very tragic, obviously. Uh... I started reading it soon after he died, and it helped me not only to cope with my pain, but also to realize the impact of his, that his life made on my own and how mine affected him. Knowing I gave him 18 months of friendship and love when he needed it the most helped me cope. His family and I call weird coincidences or moments when we feel his presence Henry hugs now. Last week, I was missing him like hell, and the prospect of starting a new year with him hurt. Then I saw the topic, and it made me feel like he was giving me one of his sarcastic smiles from the great beyond. It got me through the week, and I thank you for that. I also want to give my condolences for the passing of Grandpa Ward. If anyone is up there with the big man, it's him. Happy New Year, V. Walker. Uh, Thank you, Vanessa. Yeah, I appreciate that. So touching. Uh, I I did have a slight allergic reaction when I first read your message. Uh, I hope you get uh, a lot more Henry hugs. Yeah, this this year. Well, this year, just going forward many years. Uh, uh, Thanks for sharing a tiny bit of his story and getting his name out there for the rest of us to hear. Uh, I'm happy he lives on in you. I'm glad you recognize that despite the tragic end, the meaning you gave him mattered, that it still matters. Now he can, you know, in some way, ripple effect, live on uh, with the rest of us who, who who hear about it and hear about him. So yeah, appreciate the message and I'm, and I'm glad you uh, check out the book again. And, and now let's end on some more inspiration because fuck yeah, uh, reinvigorated sucker Nathan Newman writes, suck master on high, nip liquor of Lucifena, I particularly like that one. Uh, Bojangles' third leg, proprietor, oh, proprietor of many. There we go. I just wanted to contact you after the New New Year's special episode and tell you, fuck you, by the way, what the fuck, that I'm sobbing manly, manly okay tears in the bathroom at work. The message that you worked hard to put out this week really hit me right in the feels, man. I don't know, my allergies were acting up or something. I'm a 30-year-old man that has fucked up pretty much everything I've ever tried to do in life. Finally at 30, I'm in a stable position. But I failed to find myself with a sense of purpose. You see, I was never actually raised. My parents were always absent. My teachers never cared. Everything I know, I've had to learn myself. 
They say failure is the ultimate teacher. Having said all that, I want to tell you about my latest failure. I've been struggling with alcoholism for the last two years. That is why this New Year's episode hit me so hard. You spoke about how we try to fill our void with vices. I never even considered such a thing until you brought it up. So here I sit, uh, you lovable, non-mustache-worthy bastard, crying on a stainless steel toilet. At least uh, <laughs> that's what I want to say. The truth is, the words you said that day hit my soul like a lightning bolt, and I've been drink-free since December 29th. You really got me thinking about exactly what the fuck I'm doing on this Cosmos sailing rock and how I want to leave it. I guess the long and the short of it is you do a really special thing here. You have literally changed my life and so many others for the better. Please keep on sucking. Maybe choose a new dog to squash. I vote chihuahuas. 50% treble, 50% tremble and 50% hate is a super suspicious ratio. And as always, keep on sucking. Sorry for the long message. And I hear this is bore it. Not uh, like you give a shit, but sorry for the grammar. Not that you could even tell you mush mouth, double chin. Seriously, who asked you to shave? You get it. Love you. Seriously, thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, mush mouth, double chin fucking killed me. I first came across. I got to say, when I shaved the beard off this past summer, I was very disappointed in what lay beneath. I was disappointed in my chin. I, I, th I built up a much more chiseled jaw in my mind. Uh, not so much. Why, Nimrod? Why can't I have like a fucking Clooney jaw? Uh, the beard's now back. Back-ish is coming in. I will return to thinking I have that strong, strong jawline. As soon as it gets a little bit thicker in my brain, uh, it is for sure like, uh, yeah, like leading actor kind of jaw. Uh, just like is whenever I don't see my stomach, it's it's almost a six pack. It's like, it's not quite, but it's close, you know? Uh, I'm cutting the weed and drink for a month at least myself. I'm getting a little too regular with the nightcaps and weed myself to sleep the past few months. Started feeling like I needed it to wind down. I uh, hope your new clarity leads to a lot more enjoyment. I mean, I'm proud of you. I'm happy for you. Uh, and I'm glad you're doing it for yourself, for not someone else. You know, I, I do think that's an important distinction. Uh, it's not like someone was just pressuring you and you finally caved. It's like, no, just a conscious, like, no, I want to, I want to fucking li live a different kind of life and have more meaning in that life for me. Um, I hope, I hope you and everyone else listening, you know, can just fucking kick 2021 right in the fucking dick <laughs> or puss, right? Don't want to limit it to dick kicking. I hope, that, I hope the year is not going to be as weird overall <laughs> and as crazy as it started uh, this past week. Uh, hail Nimrod to you and everyone else. Thank you, everyone, for riding in. And let's, uh, let's get on out of here. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, more Bad Magic Productions content soon. Spooks with Scared to Death late Tuesday nights. Silliness with Is We Dumb Wednesdays at noon Pacific time. Try not to get tricked into sticking your hands into a shithole this week. And when you're distracted, that level of stink is probably pretty hard, you know, to keep on sucking. <laughs> Joe, Joe, you should come in here. Uh, What's up? The African Zulu drum music I found oh, yeah, for, yeah. That, for that commercial. It is, I love that you can't just be still. You listen, just try. Try and be still. Right? I was I was listening to this for the commercial first, and I'm like, now I'm just listening. Can't sit still if you listen to these drums. 